Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to the third and final uh, data wrangling workshop. Uh, this one is going to be on Python and Pandas. Uh, let me just drop a link to the slides if you'd like to follow along with those in the, where do they go? I just cl closed them just in time. How about that? There we go. go. Those are the slides. I'll also post a link to the, um, the GitHub with some uh, uh, example uh, files that we'll be working along with at the end. There we go. Okay. All right, so uh, before we begin, I will warn you. Uh, so the past two workshops have been on uh, R with the tidyverse and R with data table. Uh, Pandas of the three that we are doing is by far the one that I have the least experience in. Uh, so uh, I'm, we're definitely gonna, you know, I've got plenty of material before you. You know, I've, I've worked with Pandas, uh, but I'm by no means the wizard with it that I am with those other two uh, approaches. Uh, so uh, I'll answer what questions that I can. And the, uh, the workshop, the, the, the example walkthrough at the end will be interesting because I will be struggling through it uh, as will you because a lot of my approach to when I'm actually working with Pandas is I'm still at the phase where I try something, it doesn't work. And then I Google something uh, and that is a fine way to learn stuff. That's, that's how you get going with, uh, with a language like this. Okay, uh, so uh, data wrangling with Pandas, I uh, had some help on uh, converting these slides over from the R versions with, from uh, Andrew Hornstra. So thanks to him. So in this workshop, uh, we're gonna be doing a couple of things. So first we're gonna be talking about uh, what data wrangling is, uh, what we're trying to do with it. Uh, and we're also gonna be talking through some technical tips for doing data wrangling in Python using the Pandas package. And then we have a walkthrough example at the end. Uh, so I am going to assume that you have some familiarity with Python in general. We're not going to be starting from the starting starting point, uh, and, uh, but uh, you know I don't expect that you necessarily have all of the skills here. Uh, I mean, if you did, you wouldn't need to be here in the first place. Um, and uh, I'm not going to be going into super, super technical detail on all of the commands. Uh, I think that uh, what you can really get from a workshop like this is a couple of tips for starting out, uh, but then also you know just knowing what's out there in the world. Right. Uh, so you will know when you need to do a thing, what the tool is that you'll need to reach for. You might need to review the uh, uh, documentation for that tool at the time that you're actually going to use it. But I'm, it's not like I can tell you what the documentation is and then have it stick in your brain anyway. You're going to need to come to a point where you have to use it. My, the best advice that I have for anybody trying to learn a language or a new computer tool in general is to give yourself a project. Perhaps it is the example one that we have at the end of this workshop, perhaps it is something else, but just give yourself a project to work through, uh, and it will be awful the first time that you do it, uh, but by the time that you are done, you'll be a much stronger uh, at that language. Uh, throughout, I'm going to be using PD as short for pandas, because uh, I, I, you can sort of imagine that at the very beginning of all this code, I did import pandas as PD. Uh, and I'll be using DF as the shorthand for the data frame object. Obviously, data frames are sort of spreadsheet-like objects that uh, Pandas has as the way of its way of organizing data. Uh, and uh, I'm, you can sort of assume that I've created a data frame called DF, and that's going to be what we're doing some of our operations on. So what is data? Oh, sorry. And also, <laughs> interrupt me at any time. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to respond to those. Uh, and if you've been at the previous, any either of the previous versions of this workshop, you will recognize some of the material from before. Most of what's going to be new is just the technical uh, material. All right, so what is data wrangling? Uh, data wrangling is when you have data, but it is not yet ready for you to use. And so you want to get it ready for you to use. That is it. That is what data wrangling is. As long as your data is not yet in the form where you need it to be, then you should make it in the format where you need it to be. And that will be the elbow grease that is uh, data wrangling. Uh, some important tips for when you are doing data wrangling. Uh, and most of the time when I'm helping people with their data wrangling, it is because they are not following one of these tips, more so than having any sort of difficulty with the code or the language or anything like that. Uh, looking at the data is very good. Always look directly at your data so you know what it looks like. You can print out your data. 
uh, by just you know get, uh, typing in the name of the data set, right? Here's this data set. I just put out the name and it printed it out for me and I can look directly at it. What do I get from this? Well, I get to know what the data looks like. Data wrangling is all about preparing your data to be in the format that you need it to be. So you should probably know where it is so that you can know how, what you need to do to get it there. All right, so by looking at this data, I can note, okay, how is, I, I, I know that this data contains state, quarter, and rate, but uh, how is state included? Is it a two, did, is it a two letter abbreviation? Is it the whole name as it is here? If that, is that name capitalized or non-capitalized? By just looking at the data, now I know. Uh, how about quarter? Is that an actual date object? No, it is written out as a string, Q number followed by a four digit year. Uh, and the rate is from zero to one as opposed to say zero to a hundred, right? I just learned all these things by just looking at the data without having to do any sort of fancy coding. Uh, just look at your data, please I beg of you. Once you have looked at your data uh, and you wanna think about what you want your data to look like when you are done, right? You are doing this for the purpose of running some sort of analysis. So having an idea of what that analysis is going to be, or at least what format you need the data in is a very good place to be at because it will help you figure out what you're doing. Uh, so is your analysis going to be uh, where one observation is one year for one state as it might be for that data that I just showed you or one quarter for one state uh, or for one company for one day, whatever it is, right? You want to think, well, what format do I want to get it in? What kinds of variables do I want to be in that final data? So you know what your target is. So you've looked at your data, you know where it is. You, want, you thought about where you want it to go, you know your target, and then you just got to think about how you can get it there. Data wrangling is all about taking information from where it currently is and putting it where you want it to be. Uh, and that is basically the entire task of data wrangling. The information is in there. Data wrangling is very rarely about creating more information. It's just about putting the information that is out there in a usable format. Uh, so think about where it is and where you want it to be. So for example, Going back to this data, I might say, okay, I want to have a variable for year and a variable for quarter. Where's the date? Where's the where's that information? Well, here's the information. Here's year, those four digits, and then here's quarter. It's this this one right here. I need to think about how I can carry the information from the inside of this quarter variable here and stick it out in a year variable by itself. How do I take the information from where it is to where I want it to be out here? And the last big tip is. Look at your data again. After you do each step of your data wrangling process, look at what you've done. See the results of what you've done to make sure that it actually did what you expected it to do. This is a step that people tend to skip over a lot. But even though I've been doing data wrangling for like 12 years now, most uh, I'm doing it a lot. I still, every time I do a piece of code, almost every time, I will look at what happened. I will then just look at the data again to make sure that it worked properly. Because uh, the whole thing about data wrangling is that, you know, if it was easy to put the data in the format that you wanted, there would just be a command that you could push a button and it would do it for you. But the problem is that there's a lot of details in there that only you know what it exactly it is that you're going for. So, and a lot of the code is really confusing and has corner cases and sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So looking at what you've done to see whether it made sense and did what you wanted is a very good idea. So always look at your data again between each step. Otherwise, you're going to end up you know, an hour later, having written a bunch of code using what you thought the data looked like when in fact it, it was something else because you wrote a command wrong. So these are my big four tips for data wrangling. Uh, we want to look at our data. I've mentioned that a number of times. How can you do that? You can just literally print the data frame. Uh, there's also summary statistics tables. So we can, for example, take uh, this code right here and see what sort of summary statistics we have for our data. So here's OD instead of DF. And it will show us you know, the different variables that are in our data and uh, sort of the distribution of them. This can be helpful because it will let you, you know, see things like, uh, oh, hey, quarter is not a number, right? So I can't get these summary statistics because it's not a number. If you were expecting quarter to be a number, well, now you know. Uh, it will tell you things like the distribution. This is very handy to look at uh, because often, for example, uh, in data that you're handed, uh, the values might not be what you expect. Uh, so, for example, if you were to download a piece of data from the census, you might look at this distribution of, let's say, the number of kids you have and be like, wow, a lot of people sure have 99 children. That's weird. I don't think anybody really has that many children. Uh, and then that would prompt you to, to realize, oh, 99 is just their code for missing data. Right? And looking at a distribution like this would help you pick out when weird stuff like that is happening. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Uh, checking all the values that something takes is good. Uh, so doing the unique function. Uh, on an individual variable can help there. In this case, 
let's say we want to know, hey, does this include the contiguous? Uh, does this include all 50 states or just the contiguous, right? First of all, I can tell you, hey, look, Hawaii is in there, so it, it doesn't just include all of them, but I could also use PD unique, uh, OD state, right? And that would tell me what values it takes, or perhaps even better, quarter, so I can know the range of the data. What, what quarters does it cover, right? So this goes from quarter four of 2010 to quarter one of 2012. Oh, looking at your data will also tell you what kinds of missing observations you have. A lot of data, especially if it's not you know, designed for use in a classroom, has a lot of missing data in it. And so knowing how much missing data you have is very important because uh, often the presence of missing data will change how you have to handle that data. All right, so uh, those are our general tips. Now let's think about what, what we're going to do for data wrangling. What are the stages of data wrangling to go from something that is very raw to something that is prepared for you to use? And there are three main stages that I think about. Uh, sometimes you can skip one of them if your data is already sort of ready for you. But the first stage is going from records to data. Uh, the second is going from data to tidy data. And then the third is going from tidy data to data for your analysis, data that you can use uh, for whatever you're going to use it for. So let's start with going from records to data. So what do I mean by this? Uh, records are any sort of information that is out there uh, in a format that you can access. Right? It might not be in a nice data format. Uh, so for example, this could be about gathering data. It could be that somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, go check the Google trends for our marketing keywords. Okay, great. Go collect that data and then turn it. That, that, those are records out there. You can turn it into data. Uh, here's a PDF. Uh, take this PDF of, of, uh, of tax information and turn it into a table that I can read. That is a task that I do all the time. Uh, people pay me to do it, right? It's a good skill that you can have because a lot of information, especially uh, for more legacy companies is stored in these PDFs that is not always in nice spreadsheet format. Uh, here's a bunch of handwritten doctor's notes, turn it into data. Here's a website, scrape the website and find information on it. Uh, go do a survey, collect data, whatever it is. There's information out there and you are going to gather it together into a data-like format. Uh, I'm not going to go super deep into the records to data stage because there are so many different forms of records and they all require their own tools. Uh, there's not a whole lot of overlap or general things that apply here. You know, the tools that you would use to scrape a website are 100% different from the tools that you would use to read data in from a PDF or get information from Google Trends or whatever, right? Um, so I'm not going to go into it because uh, it's just not a good use of our time. But as you're doing this, look at the data a lot. That's a general tip. Uh, it applies everywhere. Look at your data. Uh, do it. Um, second, uh, if you are you, generally the, the process that you're going to be using is trying to find some structure in that raw data so that you can uh, take advantage of it when you are reading it in. Uh, for example, uh, you are reading in uh, a, a website. Maybe you're scraping a website, right? And you know, you with your human eyes can look at a website and figure out where the information is. Let's say, let's go to a, a let's do an internet search. Uh, ice cream. Right. Okay. I've done my search for ice cream. I'm working for Briars or something like that. And I want to know, you know, okay, what are the brands that are mentioned most often uh, at the top of the search results? Right. Okay. I'm going to scrape this website. I'm going to try to take advantage of the structure that I can see, but I need to get a computer to understand that structure. Right. So I'm going to say, okay, uh, first of all, how do I locate the titles of the search results? Right. Maybe I, want, I just want the titles. So I need to train my computer to say, hey, look for these, these blue links here. Uh, and pull all those out. And then I need to figure out how can I tell a computer to look for brand names, right? You're trying to take advantage of structure. So you might say, okay, well, I know that if I look at the, at the code for this page, there's got to be a code that makes these links blue uh, or turns them into links, perhaps. And so I'm going to tell it to look for links because that is the structure that I can see and I'm taking advantage of that. This is a web scraping example, but this same sort of idea applies anytime you're trying to take records and turning them into data. You have a PDF of like old tax forms. Okay, well, how do you tell it to recognize when somebody's name is? And you know, is this is this line here? Is this telling somebody's name? Or is it their address? Is it their social security number? Is it their mobile phone? I don't know. Your computer doesn't know. You have to tell it how to recognize that information. Uh, and so trying to find the structure in there and take advantage of it is really your biggest task for reading in records. Um, so you're trying to ask, how can I tell a computer how to spot where the actual data is uh, so that you can do as little by hand as possible? You want to avoid doing data entry by hand if you can avoid it at all costs, uh, not only because it is tedious and a lot of time, uh, 
but also because you are very, very likely to make mistakes. If you've ever done any sort of data entry uh, where two different people are entering the same data for robustness, you will know how often those two people enter in different things just by accident, right? It happens, we're human. So let's avoid the human stuff. If there's a structure here, we'll take advantage of the structure to automate. Okay. Uh, one, well, one common thing, I will, I will talk about a specific form of reading in records to data that comes up a lot uh, so that I will talk about some tools for it. Uh, one is that you have data that is split across multiple files uh, that you might need to process those files individually. How can you uh, locate and read in multiple files and then compile them all together? So the first step is to use the grob package uh, which has a grob function, uh, which uh, produces a vector of filing. So you can use grob to say, let's say, uh, look for all the CSV or Excel files in a folder. So if you have, you know, a folder with, you know, 300 sales reports from each of the last, you know, however many years of months of sales data, uh, you can use grob to generate a list of those file names so that you can then use a for loop as you would in, in, in if, you, if you've used Python before you've used for loops, I don't need to tell you about those. Um, to iterate over that vector to read those in one at a time. Uh, you can also, in your for loop, send each of the files that you read in to some sort of function that processes them uh, for easy processing. Once you have your, uh, your list of files that you've read in, uh, you can snip, slap them all together with a df.append, which will just take, uh, and what append does is it takes one data set and sort of stacks it on top of another one that has all the same rows, uh, is what that does. Here's an example. So as I mentioned, you have 200 monthly sales reports all stored in Excel files. Uh, you want to pull out uh, sell. You only want two variables from each of these uh, reports. Uh, you want to get total sales for that month, and you want to get the employee of the month, which are located in the same cell every time. Right? And that's what I mentioned about finding structure in these files. So if I wanted to get total sales and employee of the month, I would need to think, okay, how can I tell a computer to locate total sales and employee of the month? Maybe you get lucky and it's a format like this where it's always in the same cell position each time. It's easy to tell a computer to look in a particular cell. Maybe they're in different places. Maybe you'd need to do something a little bit trickier to say, hey, okay, look for the words total sales and then look one cell over and then look for the words employee of the month and then look one cell over. And then hopefully every single month always spells it in the same way, right? So uh, how would we do this? So first we would import glob, we would import OS because we need to interact with the uh, operating system to read in files. Uh, we would generate our list of what are called relative file paths. A relative file path is one that is uh, relative to the working directory, uh, whereas an absolute file path is one that starts from the base of the file system. So I would absolutely, if you're on Windows, for example, an absolute file path would be like C colon slash user slash documents, blah, 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 blah. Whereas a relative file path, uh, you know, if you're going from the working directory, might just say, uh, you know, I'm in my, my folder of data. That's where my working directory is look for the monthly reports folder, right? And that would just look for the monthly reports folder in that working directory. Um, the double dots here means move up one folder. So this is how, what I would do is if, let's say I was in my code folder and my monthly reports were in the sort of parent project directory over one in the monthly reports folder. And that's what I'm looking at. And then the star sales star means look for any files that have the word sales in their titles. Okay, so now we have our partial file paths. We want to turn them into absolute file paths so we can know what, uh, what to read in. Uh, for that, we can just uh, append the, um, uh, the absolute path from OS. Oops, once we have that, uh, we can then read them in. Uh, so we can use pd.readexcel to read in these Excel sheets that we have. Um, and then, oh, did we? Oh, there we go. Uh, then we can look in those Excel sheets that we've read in to get the uh, cells that have total sales and employee of the month, and then stick them all together with df.append. Let's see how that works. So here is a for loop that we have. So I'm going to start with just a sort of blank data frame that only has the column names in it. So there's no rows in that data frame. It's just columns. Um, and then I'm going to loop through the file list that I created with grob and then appended to with the file path. Uh, and then I'm it, within this loop, I'm going to read in the Excel file that I'm looking at. I'm going to find the sales uh, data, which is on the first row of the third column. Look for the employee of the month, which is on the 42nd row of the first column. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, append together uh, what I have. So I'm going to take the numbers that I just got, sales and employee, I'm going to turn that into a data frame on its own. And I'm going to append it to the data frame DF that I already made up here. So it's going to go file by file each time appending on one new row to this data set that I have here that's sort of collecting the results as they come in. All right, that's the end of the records to data uh, section. Any questions on this so far? 
Um, I have a one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so if if the uh, um, the sales and employees are like in a random position, like how would you tell the uh, um, pandas to achieve those information into the data frame rather yeah. than using the A log? So yeah, so you you have to find some structure that you could locate it with. So let's 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 make up any uh, a pretend one. Let's let's say we've got an Excel sheet here, um, and each one's different now. So if they're all the same, that's easy, right? But if, if they're different, then so maybe maybe our data looks like this: total sales two three, and then employee of the month is Jared. Okay, so if this is one sheet, and then another sheet has it like over here: total sales seven and employee of the month uh mary um so we would look at the different sheets and say okay what's the structure here how can i locate in a procedural way where the information is and in this case you would say okay i've noticed that wherever the employee of the month is it is just to the right of the words employee of the month or total sales is right next to total sales and that's consistent across my different sheets so you're looking for consistency where you can find it. Once you have that consistency, you can then tell it how to um, how to go about it. So in, in this example, we would uh, read in the file, we would uh, search through the columns for the value, or we would search through all the, all the uh, entries, we would search through each column and then each row to find the words employee of the month. Once we found that, we would store the location of that, to, of that cell we would go over one column and then we would read that in as the value employee. Same thing with sales. I would look through all the columns and all the rows for the word total sales, find that location, increase the column by one and have that be the sales. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, would you ever use like natural language processing? Like, a, I mean, I only think of Python stuff. So like a spacey, package to like interpret entities as well or is it just mostly just pattern and like type recognition um i mean anything that lets you recognize a pattern can help right so uh yeah you could totally use nat natural language processing uh, as long as that's the structure that it's in right and part of it depends on how certain you want to be of pulling it out Right. If you have a, you know, if you have a million records and you have a process that can get you the right number 97% of the time, that's probably fine. Right. Um, but if you want to, if you have a hundred records and you want to make sure that every single one is accurate, then you want to make sure that it's something that's not probabilistic at all. Um, but stuff like regular expressions, uh, searching through text uh, for patterns is definitely something mm -hmm. that's helpful for this a lot. Yeah. I was really thinking regular expressions too. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And we'll talk yeah. about regular expressions a little bit later, Jim. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, so we have our data. We've read in our Excel sheets or whatever it is, and we want to tidy that data. So for, uh, first of all, what is tidy data? So data, starting before tidy data, data is anytime you have your records in some sort of structured format, right? Some sort of structured format um, such that you could then tell a computer how to look through it. However, there are a lot of structures like this. Uh, there could be a bunch of different tables. Uh, it could be a spreadsheet where the variables are just sort of in random spots. Uh, it could be one table per observation. Um, and a lot of these structures, especially in the business world, they're designed for, to make it easy to look up values, right? If you want to say, know what your adjusted gross income was in 2012, you would look up the 2012 file. You would go down to the adjusted income row and you would locate your number, right? That's a very easy way to look up a specific value. Okay. However, that is not a good data structure for doing analysis, right? If you want to know, okay, what's my uh, what's, what's my average average go, uh, adjusted gross income been over the past twenty years? Well, to answer that question, you have to go through each file, you have to load up each file, you have to find that row in each file, you have to look up the number in each file, and then you have to put them all together, right? It's a very it's not a great process for doing any sort of analysis, even really simple analysis, simple analysis. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be aiming to put our data that we have in some structure into a specific structure, which is called tidy data, uh, which is very handy for doing most sorts of analysis. There are sorts, some forms of analysis that you probably wouldn't want to use tidy data, um, but uh, for most, most part, you're, you would want something like this. 
there is also an additional walkthrough linked here uh, for, for some more stuff. Uh, so what is tidy data? In tidy data, each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, and the third and more optional of these is that each type of observational unit forms a table. And I'll talk about what observational unit is in a second. Uh, so what do we have here? Here we have each country and their trade imbalance and their population. Each variable, a uh, thing that varies across different measurements is a different column. Right? I have measured the trade imbalance for each country. And so all of the trade imbalance values go in a single column. Uh, each row is an observation. Each different measurement that I have taken uh, is a row. Uh, and so Argentina is a country. I have measured all the different things for Argentina. So I have trade imbalance and population for Argentina all on the same row. It's all one row right there. Uh, each observational unit forms a table, meaning that uh, you uh, have a single table for whatever value, whatever, sorry, whatever level something is measured at, you have a table specifically for that level. Uh, and I'll, I'll, let me get at that in a second. Um, so uh, this will make it a little bit clearer. The variables in tidy data come in two different types. One is called the identifying variables or keys. Uh, these are the columns that you would use to look up a particular observation. Right. So I mentioned before, I want to know my adjusted gross income in 2012. I would look up the 2012 file, and then I would go down to the adjusted gross income row. Okay, so in this case, what are my measurements and what are my variables, right? Well, my variables are all the different variables that would be on a tax form, right? one of which would be adjusted gross income. And so I would have a column of adjusted gross incomes. My key, the thing that I would use to look up that value would be the year. What year of taxes am I looking at, right? And that would be the year. So I'm going to look for my 2012 taxes. Uh, and so the identifying variable or key there would be 2012. If I wanted to look up my adjusted gross income, I would say, okay, look at my uh, 2012 uh, column. That's my identifying row. Once I find my 2012, I'm going to then look over into the column that has the adjusted gross incomes, and that's going to have my adjusted gross income in it, right? So I use the identifying variables to look up data, and then the actual values and measures are over here in the other kinds of variables. So we have identifying variables and keys that you might use to look up a row. Once you've found that row, the measures and values on that row will tell you what you are looking for. Here's some example data. Uh, so here we have uh, two different people in two different years and the number of points that they've earned and the amount of shrimp that they have eaten. Uh, so here are our, our, our identifying variables and keys would be person and year. If I wanted to know how much shrimp Eleanor had eaten in 2017, I would look up person and year, right? So I'd wanna look down to Eleanor and I'd wanna look down to 2017. Those are, those are my identifying variables. I've now found the row that I'm looking for. Now that I've found this row, I can look up the values. In particular, I want to know how much shrimp she ate, which was 238. Uh, and that's the basic idea here. Uh, notice, by the way, there's no, uh, there's only one row per combination of the identifying variables. Uh, and most of the time, that is what you want to have. So there's not, for example, a second row for, that is also Eleanor 2017, right? There's only one row for Eleanor in 2017. Uh, and if I look, if I give you a particular combination of, of uh, person names and years, you should come back with only one row to look up, right? We have uniquely identified the data based on that. And that's what I mean by uh, each, there's a different table for each observation level, right? So here we have data that varies by both person and year, right? A person can eat a different, a, a different person in a different year can eat a different amount of shrimp, okay? So I, I measure shrimp consumption on the person year level. Uh, however, some things only vary by person. For example, birthplace. Your birthplace does not, does not change whatever year it is. So here is a table, a tidy table here that has person and year data. So the keys are person and year, and I can look up person year information. I might have a separate table that is just person, right? It would only have one row per person. I would look up that person by looking for the row where that person is, and then it would have things like their birthplace. That would be a different observation level. So person and year identifying variables here. Uh, the combination of person and year uniquely identifies a row, our observation level being basically the set of identifying variables that uniquely identify a row. There's only one row with that particular combination. Um, yeah. Any questions about what tidy data is? All right, so we know what tidy data is. How can we do it? How can we get our data into a tidy format? Uh, so the first of all, we need to think about what formats it might be in before we try to tidy it. Here's a common example. This is called a count table. 
Uh, what's going on here is that it has some data and it's got a bunch of different religions and it's got a bunch of different income bins. And in each cell, we have the count of how many people are in this particular cross tabulation. So uh, in this data, there are 1,116 Catholics who earn between 50 and $75,000 a year. Now, do we know this is not tidy data, right? This is not tidy data here. I can, here's how I can tell you it's not tidy data. Well, if I wanted to look up a particular thing, I might say, okay, well, I want to know how many, uh, uh, how many Buddhists uh, earn $100,000 or more, right? Well, uh, how would I look up that information? I would say, okay, uh, I would want to look up Buddhist, right? So I want to look up the religion. So here's religion, cool. And then I want to look up the income bin. So I want to look for my income column that has all the different bins in it, but oh no, that's not a column. It's spread across a bunch of columns, right? So I don't have one uh, column per variable. Uh, I have instead a variable that is split across a bunch of columns. Uh, and then I also don't have one row per observation because I've sort of squashed together all the observations that are in these particular combinations, right? So we have non-tidy data here. Uh, here's another example. Here is some, uh, some data from uh, some the billboard charts uh, looking at the chart position of different songs. Uh, so what do we have? So we have some identifying uh, variables. We have uh, artist track and date entered. If I wanted to look up, uh, you might, I guess you might count this as a value perhaps instead of an identifying variable. But if I wanted to look up uh, the chart positions of the song Kryptonite, I might say, okay, here's the artist, three doors down, here's the track Kryptonite. Uh, but then I might want to look up, okay, what position did it have in its first week in the charts or second or third or blah, 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 right? But instead of week uh, in the charts being its own variable, it is again spread across multiple variables, okay? Uh, this is not a count uh, table. This is just a, a, a table in what's called a wide format. The same value is repeated across columns for multiple observations as opposed to repeated across rows. So here we have a repeated observation of chart position, uh, but instead of having one row for week one, a second row for week two, a third row for week three, a fourth row for week four, what would be called long data. We have wide data where we have a column for week one, a column for week two, a column for week three, and so on. Uh, this particular format of data is very common in, uh, in accounting. It's also fairly common in finance, uh, just sort of for their applications, but it is often easier to do many kinds of analysis if you don't have it in this format, if you have it in, in a long, tidy format. So how do we take these sorts of data sets and turn them into tidy data? Uh, there are a number of tools for doing this, and they are flexible, thankfully, because there are many different formats that the non-tidy data comes in. Uh, but the first big tool we're going to look at is the pivot. Uh, so what a pivot does is it takes a single row with many columns, if that sounds familiar, uh, and it turns it into a single, uh, into many, many rows with one column. Right? So the sort of idea is we're going to take this right here, right, that row of observations, and just sort of turn it, right, is what we're going to do. And we're going to use these identifying variables to sort of keep track of things. So when we turn it, we're going to end up with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're going to have seven rows that go Tupac, 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 Tupac. Baby don't cry, baby don't cry, blah, 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 blah. Uh, 2000, 2000, 2000, 2000, 2000, 2000, right? And then 87, 82, 72, 77, 87, right? So it's going to basically... Uh, we're we're going to line things up by those identifying variables, and then we're going to take the values that are spread across multiple columns, turn them into one column. Uh, so this is called going from wide to long data. There's also long to wide, which we'll talk about in a bit. I will warn you that in pretty much every statistics package, pivot functions are very difficult to use for some reason. I don't know why nobody's figured out a great interface for working with them yet. Um, but it is very easy to do a pivot that does not work as you intended it to. So always be sure to read the help file and be doubly extra super sure to look at your data after you've done a pivot to make sure that it actually did what you thought that it did. Uh, if it doesn't work the first time, do some trial and error, try fiddling around with things. Okay, so we know that we're going to want to take this data long. Let's, let's check our steps that we talked about. We looked straight, straight at the data. That was good. Uh, we thought about how we wanted the data to look. We want to have one row per... Um, uh, we want to have multiple rows per artist track and week, or sorry, one row, one row per artist track and week. There we go. Uh, because that is our observation level. We have a different measurement for each artist track and week combination. Uh, and there should only be one chart position for a given artist track and week combination. Uh, we also have one common, a column that has the position in that week uh, as well as the date entered. So how can we carry information from where we, it is to where we want it to go? We're going to use a pivot, which will go from wide to long. And then after we're done, we will look at our results. This follows the same tips that I gave before of steps to follow. So let's actually do our pivot. In Pandas, the pivot functions are, uh, there's PD wide to long and PD long to wide. There's also um, 
uh, PD melt and PD pivot table, which do the same thing. The syntax is a bit harder to work with, but they are slightly more powerful. I don't know why they would make it that way. If you have a more powerful version, just make the simpler version a wrapper for that. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but wide to long and long to wide are easier to use. Uh, here we want wide to long, so we're going to use PD dot wide to long. Uh, this asks for the data set that you're working with. Uh, it asks for what are called these stub names. Uh, so a common thing uh, when you're working with wide data is that the different uh, measurements of the same variable will start, the, the variable names will start with the same letter. So here we have WK, 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 right? So it's going to know what variables all go together by getting that stub, this, the WK stub, because each variable name as it is now is WK plus something, a stub plus a number. Okay. And there could be multiple sets, right? It could be that there is not just uh, a, one column per week, but maybe there's a different value in there as well, right? Maybe this is chart position, but somewhere else we have like, uh, I don't know, something else about that song in that week in a different set of 52 uh, variables that we might want to do. So we would give it multiple stub names in that case. So we need to give it the stub names. Uh, and then we also need to give it the existing identifying variables in the I argument. Uh, and then we're going to need to add a new identifying variable, right? Because in the data, uh, we currently have one row per um, artist track or artist and track, right? But we're soon going to have one row per artist track and week. So we need a new identifying variable for that week. So we know what week we're looking at, right? It should be one, two, three, one, one two, three, four, five, and then all the values are going to line up. So we need to give it a new identifying variable to add. That's in the J argument. So here's the data. Uh, here is the stub, WK, as I mentioned. Here are the old identifying variables. I mentioned before that date entered could be considered an identifying variable or not. Um, here I've, I've included it as one just to make sure that it keeps the information when it does the, uh, the pivot. And then the new identifying variable, which I'm going to call week. Uh, I'm going to rename. Uh, when I do this, it's going to store the chart position value uh, in a variable called WK, uh, which I'm going to rename to chart position. Um, and then I'm going to drop all the missings. Uh, dropping missings with drop at NA is a common thing that you might do after a wide to long pivot, because uh, if there's any observations that don't fill up all the columns, then it's going to be blank, right? So let's say, for example, here, uh, uh, this song uh, was only in the charts for seven weeks, right? Not eight. So if I do a pivot, it will give me a row for week one, two, three, four, five, six, five, five, six, seven, and then missing for eight, nine, 10, and so on. If I don't want all those missings, if this is the only real data anyway, I can tell it to drop the NAs and it will thankfully drop all these that would in otherwise be their own rows taking up a bunch of space. And there we go. Here's the data as we get it. Uh, and uh, it didn't drop all the NAs. I wonder what that's about. Weird. Um, oh, you know, I wonder if uh, there's, a, there's a hidden underlying code that maybe doesn't have the NA in it. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Pandas will, you know, keep our identifying variables over here. It doesn't, it doesn't bother printing them out over and over again. Uh, but then the week is another identifying variable that does change every row. And then we have the chart position in that artist track data entered week combination. Any questions about pivoting from wide to long? Um, when you do axis is equal to one, can you explain what, what it does? Um, so I didn't write that particular line, Andrew did, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that what it does is, um, so uh, pandas, call, pandas data, set, data frames can have row names as well, where you, the, the rows themselves have names. Um, and so axis equals one, I believe is saying rename a column as opposed to rename a row, I think is what's happening there. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. So we might also want to go from uh, from uh, do a, a pivot from a pivot wide. Uh, so this says pivot wider. That's oops. This is some R code right there. That should say pivot wide to uh, long to wide and uh, DF append here. Um, so uh, another common non-tidy format that you might get is something that looks like this, where it's like a tax form, where each value is on its own row. And this is not tidy, right? Here are the variables that we might be interested in, person, income, deductible, AGI, but they're stored in rows as opposed to columns. 
so we would want to switch this up. Uh, so pivot is another, uh, we, we can go the other direction, pivot wide, uh, long to wide. Uh, we need similar, similar information from before. We give it a data frame. Uh, we give it the index that it currently has, uh, which in this case, there is not really an index. Uh, I want to take everything and flip it. So I don't really need to line anything up, which is what I would typically do with an index. So I've actually created a variable here called index that's zero for everybody. So I can have something to feed to the function, um, but it's not really going to do much with it. Uh, I need to tell it what the new columns are going to be, uh, what column contains the information of the new column. So I want to have a column for person, a column for income, a column for deductible, a column for AGI. So I'm going to tell it to use this variable here to locate the columns. Uh, and then here are the values that I'm going to give it here in text form row. When I do this, right, uh, pivot, index is index, columns are the value, values the form row, uh, and I get the well, exactly what I want out of it. So it has an index variable here, which is zero, that's useless. I would probably then just drop that. Uh, and then the variables that I have, as well as the values that go along with them. That's going from wide to, or long to wide. Uh, once we've done this, uh, we can use, again, df append to, uh, to stack the data sets on top of each other. Uh, so imagine, you know, I had this data set to start with. Uh, maybe I have a different person who, all, I have another tax form from a different person, which looks like this. I would want to pivot both of them. Uh, so they have the same variables, and then I could use df append to stick them together. Right? So this is just tax data two, which looks a lot like tax data one. Do the same pivot on it, and then stick them together. Uh, if I had a bunch of them, I would probably use a for loop to pivot each one of them individually, and then append them all together. All right, another task of taking data and turning it into tidy data is merging. Uh, it is very common to need to, to link two data sets together based on some shared keys. So I mentioned before, uh, we might have some data that is on the person year level and the, uh, some other data that is just on the person level. Here's some examples of that. Uh, so here's some data. We have a person. We observe each person two times in two different years, 2014, 2015. And in those two different years, that person has two different incomes. Uh, we might have a second data set where we have, let's say, their birthplace. That doesn't change over your lifetime. Uh, so we just have a table that is on the person level. So a person is the only identifying variable here. And here's their birthplace. Uh, merging data together with the merge method, I uh, will do exactly this. Uh, there are some options in there that are important to think about. There's a how argument uh, in the merge uh, function. And what how does is it determines what happens when you don't have a match, which is very important to think about because a lot of the time working with real data, some of the values in one data set are not going to have a match in the other data set. So what do you do when you don't have a match? Because right, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to link these two things together, right? I want to look at this data set and have another column here called birthplace that says, okay, uh, Ramesh was born in Crawley and Whitney was born in Washington, D.C. So it should say Crawley, Crawley, Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. Uh-oh, David's not in this data set. What are we going to do with David? He doesn't have a match, right? To figure out what we're going to do with David, we would need to, to determine the how argument. Uh, setting how to left, uh, there's basically two data sets, whatever, you know, df.merge, df would be the left data set, whatever goes in the merge formula would be the right data set. Uh, set how to left will keep any observations that are in the left data set, but not in the right. Uh, it will keep them and it will just fill in the, the non-matching values with missings, NAs. Uh, right will keep things that are in the right data set, but not the left. Outer will keep things from both. Inner will keep matches, only things that actually match and drop everything that does not match at all. Uh, you can also deal with different variable names in the two different data sets by using, uh, in, we have to specify the variables that we're merging on with on but you can uh, have them be named differently with left on and right on. So let's take an example here. We have person year data, which was that uh, per, uh, uh, person year income thing over here. We're gonna merge that with person data, which was the birthplace. Here I'm gonna set how to left. So what's gonna happen? Remember we have David who does not have a birthplace uh, information in there. So this is a left merge, which means that if you're in person year data, but not in person data, we're gonna keep you, okay? Uh, we're merging on person because that is the shared key. That is the identifying variable that is in both data sets. So I'm going to use that to line people up. And I'm going to keep anybody who's in person your data and not in uh, uh, person data. So we have Ramesh, Whitney, and David. They're all here, uh, even though David does not have a birthplace uh, because we did a left merge. We lined them up with the person variable like that. Uh, we can also do a right merge. Oop, and it looks like it fell off the screen here. Um, but uh, this time I'm doing a right merge, which means I'm going I'm to keep anything that matches. Matches are good. 
And I'm also going to keep anything that doesn't find a match that was in the right data set. Uh, and in this case, uh, the, David is in the left data set and doesn't find a match. So he gets dropped in this one. So this data set, right, this merge right here will look like these rows, but David will be gone uh, because he was, he was, he did not find a match. And we're only keeping non matches from the right data set, but David was in the left data set. Uh, something important to keep in mind uh, when you're working with a merge is that it's it's important to make sure that your observation level or that you that, that the uh, the variables that you are merging on is the exact observation level in at least one of the data sets. Okay, you want that to be the case. Um, what I mean by this, remember the observation level is the mix of identifying variables that uniquely identify a row. There should not be a second row with that same mix of variables. So in this data, person year. We do not have multiple rows per combination of person and year. The observation level here is person and year. The observation level here is person. We merged on person, which is the observation level for this data set. And we want it to be the observational observation level in at least one data set. So that's good. What happens if we don't have that? Uh, if you have multiple observations per combination of the on variables in both data sets, that's a problem because what it will do is it will uh, give you every possible combination of the two, which you might, you probably don't want. Sometimes you do, but you probably don't most of the time. Here's an example. So here's some data. Uh, so we have two data, two variables here in the first data set. Uh, name is AA, then BC. The years are 2014, 2015, 2014, whatever. So you'll notice that name and year combined together is the observation level of this data set. If I choose a combination of name and year, I will only find one row with that combination. Over here on the right, I have name is A, A, B, C, C, and then characteristic. Now the shared variables here is name. But notice that name by itself is not, the is, is not enough to identify a row in, over here in A, right? Name and year are, but name by itself is not because there's two rows with A. Over here on the right, uh, name is the, is the shared one. It also does not uniquely identify the rows, right? It's got two A's, it's also got two C's. So what's going to happen when I merge these together on name? Well, I'm going to end up with four A's, right? I started with two A's over here and two A's over here. Two times two is four, right? It's going to give me each possible combination. So here I had A 2014, A 2015, or I guess A 2014, one, A 2015, two. Uh, and then over here on the right, I had A up and A down. So I'm going to get A 2014, one up, A 2014, one down, A 2015, two up, A2015, two down. Every possible combination I could have. Uh, so we have four A rows here, which is generally not what we want. So it's a good idea to check what your observation level is before you do a merge to make sure that at least one of your data sets has that as the observation level. How can you check this? You can use the duplicated function. Uh, so take your, um, uh, your data set, check if, it is if, a, if a particular column or set of columns has any duplicates in it. Uh, and then use max to check if any any of the rows are duplicated. If this shows true, uh, then you then you do have a duplicate in there, right? Because what this does is is gives you uh, whether a particular row is duplicated, and then max checks if any of the rows are duplicated. If you do have duplicates in both of your data sets, you can then figure out how to proceed. Maybe you do want that full combination thing. Uh, maybe you can drop some observations to restore. Uh, uh, the observation level. Maybe there's only like one row in there that's duplicated and it's just a mistake and you can drop that one. Lots of different things you can do. You can also aggregate things down to the to make the, the unique level. All right, that is going from uh, data to tidy data. Are there any questions on this stuff? Next, we have tidy data. We need to get it ready for our analysis. Once we have tidy data, that's usually not the end of it. There's still usually quite a bit of work to go. So uh, we have our nice tidy data set with one column per variable, one row per observation. We know what our observation level is. We've merged in whatever we need to merge. We've stacked whatever we need to stack, but we still need to get things ready for our analysis. What can we do? Uh, so a bunch of things we can do. The first thing uh, we can think about doing is filtering. Uh, filtering is the process of picking particular rows out of your data. You might only want to do your analysis on a subset of your data. And so filtering is a good way to do that. 
so for example, if you use the condition income is above 100,000, uh, that will be true for everyone whose income is above 100,000. And so I could filter on income being above 100,000 to give us a new uh, data set that only has people with those high incomes. There's two main ways, there's a number of different ways to do this. There's two main ways to do this in Pandas. One is query and one is loc. Um, so uh, so here I've, I've merged together that full person data here, right? This is that same merge that we had before, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna filter to just having people with incomes above 100,000. So I'm gonna use uh, dot query with my data set, and I'm going to give it the query income is above 100,000. All right, so that's one way that you can do things. I just feed in the condition that I'm looking for, and it will give me back the just the rows, right? So uh, Ramesh, if you remember, only had income in like 80,000, something like that. Ramesh is no longer in here. Um, oh, do I not have a loc observation sample? What happened to loc? Oh, this used to be two slides, but it got squashed. Um, you can similarly do this with loc, uh, where you just feed the condition into the loc uh, brackets there. Uh, this relies on us being able to construct logical conditions. Filtering is all about checking whether you know, the row op, you know, satisfies some condition and then keeping it on that basis. Uh, you know, Python is generally based around the, the uh, assuming that the first way that you're going you're gonna to filter a data is by giving it certain index numbers, um, which uh, often in data analysis is not the way that you would do things, right? It's, it's rare in data analysis to be like, okay, I want to do my analysis on rows 200 through 300, right? Generally, that's not just how data is structured. Uh, it's instead going to be on some condition. Um, so you want to know how to construct those conditions. So in Python, uh, you can give it a logical condition. If it's true, it gives you the true, which is also one if you want to do a calculation with it. If it's false, it gives you false or zero. Uh, there's a number of tips for constructing logical conditions. Uh, if you have two numbers that you want to compare, right, you've probably done this before, right? Check if A is greater than B or greater than or equal to or less than or less than or equal to. Uh, you can use the double equal sign to check if they are equal. In Python, as with many programming languages, uh, a double equal sign will check if something is equal, whereas a single equal sign will be used to assign something, right? So if, you know, you're doing, uh, God, that zoom bar does get in the way, doesn't it? You know, uh, A is equal to one, right? This will create the object A equal to one. A double equals one will check if A is indeed equal to one, which it is because I just made it equal to one. Uh, I can also use the uh, exclamation point to check if things are not true. Is A not equal to one? No, because it is equal to one, so it's not not equal to one. Uh, you can also do not A equals one, which will do the same thing. Not is a bit more flexible because you can use it for things that are not double equals, right? This only checks something is not equal, but you can also do something like is a uh, greater than three. I know that it's not greater than three, right? Uh, so this this should be false, which makes not this true. And there we go, right? So thinking through those sorts of logical conditions is, is handy. Um, uh, good ways to uh, other good thing, ways to, uh, logical conditions that pop, commonly pop up when you're doing data analysis. Uh, checking if something is in a list. Oops, that is some R <laughs> residual R code as well. This should be just a regular bracket Python style. Um, uh, you can check if A is in some val set of values. So is A in uh, one, two, three, four, five? Yes, it is, because it's one, and that's in that list. Is it in two, three, four, five? No. Uh, this can be handy. You know, uh, this also works for things like, like strings. Is the letter A in A, B, C? Yes, it is. Um, you can put a not in front of a condition to reverse it. So two plus two double equals four is true, but not that is false. Uh, you can also chain multiple conditions together, which is handy you know, if you have something that's based on multiple variables in your data set uh, using and or or as you would expect. Uh, if you are going to chain multiple conditions together, I would recommend wrapping everything in parentheses to avoid errors. Uh, so you know, for example, I want to check if A is in this. Uh, and uh, I also want to check if the number A is in two, three, four, right? Uh, if I'm doing this, I would probably want to wrap both of them in parentheses just to make sure that it doesn't confuse things, right? You know, in this case, it wouldn't have confused it. It would have been fine. 
Uh, but let's say I was doing, uh, you know, I don't know. There, there are certain ways in which you, it, you can end up confusing it and end up like this part get, gets checked as part of this condition. You want to avoid that. Just be clear, you know, use parentheses so that it's all, uh, all good to go. Okay, that's checking rows, right? We construct a logical condition, put it into a query or a loc, uh, and it will give us back just the rows that satisfy that condition. We might also want to select columns. Uh, plenty of ways to pick just a subset of the columns. Why might we want to do this? Well, maybe we're just tired of looking at it. Maybe you want to save some space. Maybe it's just literally useless at this point. You want to get rid of it. Uh, you can uh, use indexing. You can also use the drop function uh, to, get, to get rid of columns. Uh, you can also do it uh, by column number with iloc uh, for columns, and it will just pick certain columns of the data for you. Uh, you can use drop to not pick certain columns, which honestly is probably more common anyway. Uh, if you're working with a big data set, you know, you're going to want to drop one or two columns, not list all of the columns that you want to keep, because that'd be a very long list. So here's another example. Uh, so we've got our person year data, uh, and I am using uh, uh, a bunch of different ways of picking just the person and year variables out of the data set that has person, year, and income. So one thing I can do is I can use the variable names. So here I've got a an array of column names. I'm passing that to my data frame, and it's going to give me back just those column names. Great. Uh, next, maybe I'm going to try, instead of keeping person and year, I'm going to drop income. So I can use drop to drop income along that column axis. I can also use iloc to just keep the first and second uh, columns, which are, of course, in the zero and one positions. So I'm passing that to iloc to just keep those columns, which would get rid of the third, which is income. Uh, all three of these would be different ways of selecting columns. Uh, another handy thing is sorting values. Uh, sort values sorts the data. That's what it does. Pass it some column names. It will sort by those columns. Uh, this can come in handy in a couple of different places. Often you would want to sort the data before you save data for somebody else to look at, make it easier to navigate. Uh, there are also some data manipulation tricks that we'll talk about in a bit that rely on knowing where in the data particular rows are. So you can use sort values to put those rows where you want them to be. Uh, any questions on those first things before we get to assigning variables? Okay. All right. So commonly in data analysis, we want to assign a new co uh, column or variable name uh, or overwrite the ones that we already have. Uh, this is pretty straightforward, right? Uh, so I can create a new variable, take my data set, make my new variable, just add it in there in brackets, say what I want it to be, uh, and then assign it to whatever I want it. So here, here's the next year. So I'm just going to take year and add one to it. Easy. Uh, here is a variable that checks that is, uh, instead of filtering on whether somebody has an income above 100,000, I'm just going to create a variable that indicates whether they are. So here's my logical condition. I'm going to check each person's income to see if it's above 100,000, and then store that information as a new row. Right. So I've got all my information here. That part's straightforward enough. Uh, there are some things that get difficult uh, when you're, do, you're doing some data ranking and trying to assign new columns. Uh, one is when you want to create a categorical variable. So for example, maybe you want to take a, uh, a continuous variable that has lots and lots of different values and then sort of bin it into uh, some categories. Um, you can use loc to just update some rows of your data, which you can then use to create your categorical variable based on uh, uh, some conditions. This is called a Boolean mask, where we're using a, uh, a logical condition or a Boolean to just affect some rows at a time. Um, so I'm going to use between to check whether a variable takes a certain value between certain values, and I'm going to assign a categorical variable based on that, based on income. So what am I doing here? So I'm going to start. I'm going to create an income bracket variable based on income. Uh, I'm going to start by assigning everybody to be under 50k. Right, that's just the starting basis right there. And then we're going to revise that as we find that people, in fact, have incomes above 50K. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use loc to just change the income, the, uh, the income bracket variable for people who have incomes between 50,001 and 100,000. So here is the uh, condition that I'm going to use. So this between condition checks whether each observation has an income. Right, here's the data. Take the income variable, check if that variable is between these two numbers. If it is, give me true. If it's not, give me false. Uh, I'm going to pass the trues and falses to loc, uh, which will then just give me back the trues. So in other words, it will just give me back the incomes between 
uh, 50,000 50, and 100,000. And it will specifically be working on the income bracket variable. I'm going to assign that to be the 50 to 100 category. I'm going to do the same thing for 100,000 100, 100, to 1 to uh, 20,000, do the exact same thing. Uh, and then um, the, you instead of having to use between, I'm just going to check if you're above 120,000. Uh, if you are, I'm going to take your income bracket variable and set it to be above 120,000. Right. So I've, I've gone uh, case by case and I have adjusted the rows that applied to each case to fill them in with the category that I want to assign them to be. And we end up with our bracketed uh, income variable there. Um, you can you notice that this doesn't necessarily have to be a value. So what you, you'll notice that what we were doing is we were going case by case and then assigning a value to a column, right? But it doesn't have to be a value. It can also be a calculation. Maybe you want to calculate a particular variable differently for different people in the data. Uh, so for example, let's say I want to uh, inflation adjust my income numbers. Well, I would want to adjust the income, but only for the 2014 observations, right? If, if I'm going for 2015 dollars, that data is already good. Uh, so I can just leave that as is. I only want to adjust the calculation for the 2014. So I'm going to use the same Boolean mask approach. I'm going to check if your year is 2014. If it is, I'm going to I'm going to uh, work on your inflation adjusted income, and then the uh, star equals here. That is taking the original value and multiplying it by 0 .0, uh, 1 .001 to inflation adjust it. You can also use this whenever you want to just adjust some of the observations in there. All right. The next thing that comes in handy when you're creating uh, new variables uh, is the group by uh, uh, function. What this does is it, it turns the data set into a grouped data set, which what this effectively does is it says, OK, we have a data set. And there's a bunch of different groups in it. And whenever you want me to do a calculation that, say, summarizes some of the data in this group, I'm going to do it separately for each group. That's what I'm going to do. So it's, I'm going to sort of act as though this data set has been split into a bunch of different data sets, one for each combination of the variables in the group by argument or group by function. Uh, once we have our grouped data, there's a couple of different functions that come in handy. One is transform. Another one is add, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, that basically uh, allow you to perform these within group calculations based on the grouped data. So here's an example. Uh, let's say I want to figure out, OK, uh, I know what your income is, and I want to know, are you earning more or less this year than you normally do? So I want to calculate your income relative to your mean income. So I can't just take your income and subtract out the mean of income, because that would be, uh, that would be relative to everybody's mean, right? And I don't want that. I just want relative to your mean. So if I want to get your mean, I should take my data uh, and group it by person. Right? So here I've got person year data. I'm grouping it by person. So now when I do a calculation, it's going to do it within each person. Uh, I'm going to be working on the income variable. I'm going to use a mean transformation to calculate the mean of income for each person. And then I'm going to subtract this from the original income variable so that I can get your income relative to your mean income in each year. Okay. Uh, and you can use transform like this, right? To, you know, the tr using transform here is important because it means that we still have the, uh, it sort of lines up properly <laughs> with the original data, which we want. Uh, and I've just, the, the function that I'm passing it is in quotes here. Uh, so why is group by useful? Well, if you, if you, it can be one thing if you were trying to do these sort of group level calculations, which I was in the previous slide, that's one obvious way you can use it. But in general, you want to look at where information is and think about where it needs to be. Right. And anytime you want to take information from one part of a person's data and move it to another, group by is going to be important for making sure that you're only moving it within that person. Okay. Also, group by can be then used to change the observation level with ag. Ag, which is short for aggregate, uh, is a, a process of taking each of those data sets. Let's say you know, we did it by person. Uh, but instead of trying to maintain the original observation level, as we were there, right? We, when we did uh, your income relative to the mean income, we still wanted one observation per person per year. But what if I want to take that person year data and turn it into just a person data set, right? I can use ag to do that, grouping by person and then doing some sort of uh, summary uh, calculation that gives me back one observation per person. I will end up with a data set that only has one observation per person. I've changed the observation level from person year to just person. Uh, if you're doing ag, by the way, count, or, or any of these transformations count, gives you a count of the number of rows in each group, which often comes in handy. Here's an example of ag in action. 
Uh, and so uh, one row per group. Yeah, okay, so we have a person in your data. I'm gonna group it by person. I'm then gonna aggregate. Here's the aggregations that I'm gonna do. I want you to create me a variable called income that is the mean of income. Or I want you to, sorry, to take my income variable and uh, take the mean of it. So I'm gonna get the mean of each in person's income across all the years. Then I want to just say, how many times do you see this person? Uh, just count them up. I count up how many rows we have per person. Uh, and then uh, that will also tell me something. And I'm going to rename person into years track. So now I know what is each person's average income and how many years did I have to watch them to get this average. All right. That is the basics of going from uh, tidy data to our analysis data. Uh, any questions on this point? Now, there's there's going to be some more stuff on dealing with particular variable types in a second, but this is sort of the, the basics. These are the tools that we can use very flexibly. Pretty much everything else we're going to do is detail. This is the sort of general structure of what you're going to be trying to do. Okay. So uh, that's the general structure of what we're going to be trying to do. How can we actually do it to particular variables? How can we clean particular variables? Uh, so um, how can we take a variable that is already in a tidy data set and perhaps even almost in the format that we need it for analysis, but make it into something we can actually use? There are a lot of different variable types. Uh, nu numeric, there's a lot of different numeric variable types. Uh, there's string variables, there's categorical variables, there's date variables. These all pop up quite a bit and you'll probably come across them. Some of them are harder to work with than others. Uh, it's important to be able to figure out what types your variables are. Sometimes your variables are not the types that you expect. For example, you might read in a Excel file and think, oh, this is numeric data, and then try to do a calculation on it, and it doesn't work because it turns out it read in all the data as a character variable for some reason, right? So how can we uh, check the types of our variables as we have it? Well, we can use the D types. Uh, if you just do df.dtypes, it will tell you the types of all the variables. You can also convert them uh, if you're if it's in the format that is possible to convert using as type. So here is the uh, that tax data that we had before. Something about that tax data, when it came in, uh, we had one column for the names of the rows, you know, adjusted gross income, uh, tax amount, etc. And then we had the name, uh, the person's name, uh, and then their val the values down there as well, right? This column over here that had the data in it, that had the values, it started off with their name, which is a string, which sort of forced all the other uh, uh, rows in that column to also be strings. So when we did the pivot, they were all still strings, and we would probably want to then convert them, uh, which we can do with as type. So now that we've pivoted it, they're ready to be converted, uh, which we can do with the as type function. I'm going to take your AGI, turn that into a float64, which is a numeric variable. Uh, different kinds of numeric variables. There's floats, there's doubles, there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, it just has to do with how much precision it stores, like how many digits it goes out. You know, integer doesn't go any, anywhere past the decimal place. Uh, you know, there's different things. Uh, so we're going to turn uh, AGI deductible and income into numbers, uh, and we're going to make the person variable into a category. We could have kept it as string, but we decided to make it a categorical variable here. So notes about numeric data. As I mentioned, it comes in multiple formats, uh, depending on the level of precision that you want in your data, float, int, et cetera. Uh, generally, there are functions, just the name of that type that allow you to convert between types. So if you want to take an integer, turn it into a float, you can do that float function. If you want to turn something into an integer, you can use it with the int function. Uh, one common problem to watch out for in data wrangling uh, is that uh, a lot of the time, uh, a lot of data sets will have ID numbers, and those ID numbers will be very long numbers. OK, uh, so, for example, maybe you have like a 16 digit uh, ID number for your customers in your data. OK, now what happens when you read that data in to Python? Sometimes it will work and it will recognize I need to have all this information in here. I have a 16 digit number. I'm going to store a 16 digit number. But sometimes it will not. It will say, oh, OK, 16 digits. Well, you know, um, Maybe, uh, maybe you want like the first 12, and that's as much precision as you need, right? Because the different variable types have different levels of precision. So if it gets read in as a certain, uh, as, a, as a type that does not have enough room for all the information, it's going to drop some observations, some, uh, some digits at the end, and you're going to get very confused when it looks like you have 18 different customers all with the same ID. So it's very important when you're reading in data, especially if it has these long ID codes, to specify the types of variables that you're getting. 
Uh, so you can use the call types uh, argument in most of the uh, uh, pandas uh, data reading uh, functions. Uh, often, if you have something like a very long ID code, you're, it's in your best interest to have it read in as a string variable, because then it won't even try to concatenate it. OK, so numerics I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, because you probably have a lot of experience with them anyway. Uh, character variables will come up a lot when you are cleaning data, not just when you're working with text information, but also numbers sometimes just get read in as strings, or information comes to you in string format, and you need to turn it into numbers. Uh, so in Python, uh, double quotes are, I believe, currently preferred for making strings, but single quotes are also OK, especially if you need to have a quote in the string itself. You can stick strings together with plus, uh, or uh, if you have a vector of strings, you can use join. So h plus lo becomes hello uh, using uh, a, uh, a character, and then dot join will join whatever uh, things you give it in the vector with the character that you've given it. Uh, it's important to note out that messy data will often default to character. For example, if you're reading in a data set of a, a bunch of big numbers, uh, it might have the, the entry 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We know that that's the number a million, but sometimes pandas will not make that conversion. Uh, and it will just read it in as the string 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, and you would need to then convert it into a format where it can recognize it as a number. Uh, I'll come back to those in, in working with strings in a second. Uh, there's also, let's talk about categorical variables for a second. Uh, categorical variables are basically, they're sort of like a mix between string variables and numeric variables, uh, where in memory, what it's doing is it's saying, okay, this, this variable is one, two, three, two, five, one, right? For the different rows that I've measured. But I'm going to label those numbers. So one is, let's say, uh, you live in California, and two is you live in Washington, and three is you live in New York, right? So those no we have numbers stored in the data, which is very space efficient, but they're labeled, which lets us use them to represent different categories. Uh, you can use the categor categorical function to specify these. You can also put them in order. Uh, for example, we had that income bins variable earlier. Uh, we could put that in order from smallest to largest. In fact, let's do that. So uh, we're going to start with a series of data. So we have uh, some different income bins here. We have 50 to 100K, less than 50K, 50 to 100K again, and then 200K pluses. I'm going to use it in the categorical function. I'm going to um, tell it what categories it has, right? Those three categories I just talked about. And I'm going to say, yes, there's an order to this, right? Less than 50K is less than 50 to 100K. Uh, so when I take this and I sort it, it knows to sort it in the correct order, right? Less than 50K goes at the start, then the 50 to 100s, then the 100Ks. This is not what we would get if we left out ordered equals true. If we left out ordered equals true, it would, it would sort it as alphabetical, right? And so it would go in the order 50 to 100K, or it would actually would go 100K plus first, because one comes before five, then it would go 50K, and then it would go less than 50K, right? Completely out of order. But because we, we, or we told it the order, it can maintain that. Uh, dates are important uh, to think about. They come up in a lot of data, especially business data. They're just hard to work with. Um, in general, they will be a pain when they pop up, and hopefully you can just avoid as much pain as possible. Um, Pandas does, thankfully, uh, consolidate a lot of variable types into date time. I mean, one of the difficulties with the date is how precise is the information. Uh, do you have a year variable? Do you have a year month variable? Do you have a year month day variable? Do you have a year month hour variable? Do you have a year month hour minute variable? Do you have a year month hour minute second variable, right? All these are basically different kinds of information and they all work in different ways, right? You know, if you said, uh, you know, take my year month variable and add a month to it, it's pretty obvious that you want to go to the next month. But what if you have a year month day variable and it's, let's say, January 31st, and you want to add a month to it. Does that go to February 28th, or does that go to, like, March 3rd, right? What, what does the jump mean? And, and so each different kind of time variable has to work in different ways. So uh, I'm not going to go super into detail here, because there, this is a, a long subject, and it really comes down to the kind of thing that you're faced with. But there's a good guide here that you can walk through for working with date times in, uh, in Pandas. Okay, I am going to focus on strings, though, because this is something that pops up a whole lot in data wrangling, especially when you're cleaning particularly messy data or data that was not intended to go into a analysis format. Uh, so, uh, you know, things like typos will pop up. That's one thing. Uh, but there's a lot of just string cleaning operations that are going to go into things like getting like getting substrings, splitting strings in two, cleaning them, detecting patterns. Uh, so first thing that's going to pop up is getting substrings. So Often you will want to pull a particular part of a string out of that string. 
Um, so for example, uh, let's say we're working with NAICS industry codes. They are six digits long. Uh, so for example, for a retail outlet, you might have like 481352, okay? Um, but the, sub, the subsets of, that, of the, those, uh, those digits mean something. So the first two digits, the 48, that means it's a retail outlet. Then the next, the, then the first four, 4812 or whatever I said, that's more specific. Maybe that is uh, clothing outlets. Then all six is the most specific. Maybe that is uh, teenage clothing outlets. I don't know, right? And so let's say that I, I have a data set that has any ICS codes in it, but I only want the broad industry. I might just take, I might use a substring to just get the first two characters of that code. Uh, so that's one thing that I could do. Python, I think, makes this easier than any other language that I've seen because you can just index the characters of the string uh, from start to end. So hello from one to three gives you uh, ELL because that is the second, third, and fourth uh, characters in that string, right? So getting substring super easy. You can use negative values to read from the end of the string. So hello of negative one is just the O from the end of the string. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so geographic uh, indicators, sense block group indicators uh, are 13 digits long. Uh, the first two of which can tell you what state you are looking at. So it's the state FIPS code. So here I've got a data frame that has the census block group in it. Uh, and I've told it to be string. Great, right? well, I use the D type string to make this into string data instead of numbers. Uh, so what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna get the state out. I'm gonna get the state variable out of there by taking my CBG variable I'm going to use apply uh, with a lambda to apply a function to each of these uh, observations here. Uh, and I'm going to use this. I'm going to say, OK, give me back the first uh, uh, the zero to two characters. Um, if, uh, if the string is uh, 13 characters long, otherwise give me just the first one. Why am I doing this? Well, because uh, I, this data has come in as numbers. And numbers drop leading zeros. Something to keep in mind when you're working with uh, things that can be either numbers or strings. So you'll notice if you look really closely that uh, this is only uh, 12 digits long and this is 13 digits long. So the state FIPS code is actually one over here, not 15, and it's 10 over here, okay? So if it is a 13 character string, I do want those first two characters, but if it's only, if it's only 12 digits, I only, I only want the first one. So uh, by applying this Lambda function, I end up with just the first character uh, from this one and the first two characters from this one. There are, of course, other ways to go about this. Uh, you know, in this case, you could divide and then take the, the divide by what, 100, uh, one with 12 zeros after it, and then take the floor. That would also work without having to convert to string, but string is more general um, and it can be handy as well. Um, a lot of data sets, especially business data sets, will try to stick multiple pieces of information into a, into a single cell that you will then want to split out. Uh, so, for example, let's say you want you're, you, the information that you have in there is a list of things that is held in a single Excel sheet, uh, a single Excel cell. Uh, you can use string split to split this apart. For example, if you have the string a comma b and you split it by comma, it will turn into a vector or an array of a comma b as two separate things. Um, in uh, in data that's already tidy, you can use dot string split to split across columns, uh, which works pretty well. So here's a data set where I have a category variable where I've got two categories in each cell. I've got sales and marketing here. I got HR and marketing here joined by a comma. I can take my category variable. I can split it according to comma. Uh, expand equals true will turn it into those two columns. Uh, and I'm going to name those two columns category one and category two uh, with rename. And so now I, instead of having sales comma marketing, I have sales over here, marketing over here. Instead of H&R comma marketing, I have H&R over here, marketing over here. Uh, often we will also need to clean strings. Uh, strings often come with a lot of unwelcome characters in them. Uh, maybe the same word is written multiple different ways in the same data set, which can make things hard. Uh, sometimes there's a bunch of white space in there at the beginning or end, uh, or characters that are going to mess you up. For example, I gave that example before of like uh, uh, one, numbers with commas in them can sometimes mess you up. Uh, you might want to get rid of those commas. Uh, there's a number of common stream, string cleaning functions, uh, one of which is strip. Strip will remove white space from the beginning or end of a string. Uh, so for example, this uh, string right here, space, hi, hello, space. If I strip it, we'll get rid of the beginning and end spaces and just give hi, hello without the spaces. Uh, if you only want one of those sides, there's R strip and L strip. Uh, string replace is very handy. Uh, I use string replace all the time uh, when you're cleaning strings. 
Uh, it's good for eliminating or fixing unwanted characters. So for example, uh, in this case, I got you know, these numbers with commas in them, uh, but I'm gonna use string replace to replace all the commas with nothing. And then once those are gone, I can turn those numbers into integers as I want. Uh, this comes up a lot more broadly than just commas in numbers. Uh, for example, it is common if you're reading in text data uh, for the, uh, the, um, the character system of the original data to not be something that Python can handle. So you might read it in and like the apostrophes that were in the original uh, text data turn into like, you know, ampersand at sign hashtag, right? Where it's wrong. Uh, and if you can recognize the conversion error that has been made, I mean, A, you might be able to change the character set when you're reading in the data. Uh, most of the Python uh, or Pandas data reading functions, you can choose the character set. If you look in the, in the documentation uh, and hopefully you can find one that matches the original data, but not always. Um, if, but if you can't, you can just replace that ampersand at sign hashtag with an apostrophe that it can handle using string replace. Any questions um, up to this point about strings before I go into regular expressions? Um, just a one quick question. So there was time where in the column name column, um, there was the you know character string um, character um, data type. Um, there was like number inside in it. So let's say, you know, my name is Tohun Kim, but let's say there is the number between Tohun and a Kim. So Tohun one Kim. In that case, how can I like identify and then just remove the uh, um, the numbers? You use a regular expression, which we're about to get to. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Okay, all right, so. Detecting patterns in strings. Uh, this is something that you will often need, need to do, and every time you have to do it, you will hate it, uh, but it is a necessary task. So um, uh, re what a regular expression is, is a, it is a way of looking through a string, or it's broader than this, but in, in application, what it often is, is looking through a string and checking for a particular pattern. And computers are very good at this. All you have to do is tell it how to recognize the pattern. And telling a computer how to recognize a pattern is a lot of the hardest work in, uh, in data wrangling. And I guess coding more generally. Um, uh, so reg a regular expression is a way of describing a pattern in a string in such a way that a computer can recognize it. Sometimes this is really simple. So for example, when we did string replace with this comma, this comma is a regular expression. It was telling uh, pandas to look for commas. You see a comma, that's the pattern I'm looking for. Get rid of it, right? That's a very simple regular expression. But it can get a lot broader than this. Uh, there's a guide I've linked here for more, a lot more documentation and details, but I'll just tell you some of the most common ones that pop up. So if you're looking for a number, as you mentioned, uh, you can use this. The square brackets tell it to look for a category of things here. Um, look for anything from zero to nine. So it'll look through the string and look for a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If it finds one, then it has recognized the pattern. Uh, same thing for letters. Uh, this I can use to look for any letter, any lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z. We'll look for any of those things. Uh, stars can be used to repeat the search that you just did until you see the next thing. Uh, and there's a lot more than I just said, but honestly, the things that I just told you in those two bullet points will get you pretty far a lot of the time. Let's take an example. Uh, so let's say that we have some data uh, for companies that are publicly listed, and we want to uh, uh, indicate that they are publicly listed, but we want to not keep the ticker, uh, the stock ticker that they have in the company name that's there. Um, so how can we do this? We need to tell uh, Pandas how to find a stock ticker in a string that, can, that might contain a stock ticker and might not. So we're going to use this regular expression. So what is going on in this mess right here? Let's work from the inside out. So. Uh, I can tell you, first of all, I looked at the data. This is what the data looks like. Uh, here is Amazon with its stock ticker inside of it. Here is Cargill Corporation, which is not publicly traded. It also has some parentheses, but it is not a stock ticker, okay? So I'm defining a stock ticker by the presence of capital letters, okay? But that's not all. If that was all that it was, it would take the A out of Amazon. We don't want that. So I'm looking for capital letters, letters from A to Z, capital A to capital Z. I'm going to repeat that search. Dot star will say, okay, you just, you just found a capital letter. Keep looking for capital letters. Keep looking for capital letters. How about these things on the outside? So I don't just want a bunch of capital letters in a row. I want capital letters in a row that are surrounded by parentheses, right? So I'm going to look for a parentheses. 
uh, to start things off with. And what's this double backslash? Well, a parenthesis has a special meaning in a regular expression. So if I just put the parentheses in, it will think that I'm using that to construct the regular expression, which I'm not, right? Same thing here, like if I had, if I wanted to, if I wanted to find a square bracket in there, and I just put square bracket, it would be like, oh, you're looking for A to Z, right? It would be, it would get, it would get confused. But I want an actual parentheses. So I'm gonna use backslash backslash to what's called escape the parentheses so that it knows that I'm treating it as an actual character and not part of the code, okay? Um, so I want you to look, look through the string. When you find a parentheses, an opening parentheses, perk up. You've started to find the pattern. Once you found this parentheses, I want you to check if the next thing is a capital letter. Ah, is it? If it still is, we're still going. If the next thing is not a capital letter, then we're out, right? But if it is, keep going. You found that parentheses, you found a capital letter. Do you find more capital letters? Great, keep going. If you still, if you, as long as you keep going character by character and you keep finding capital letters, you're still on track. And I don't want you to stop finding capital letters until you find a close parentheses. So this regular expression says, find an open parentheses, find a bunch of capital letters in a row, and then find a close parentheses. If we can match that pattern, that is a stock ticker by our definition. Uh, and we're gonna use that to do the analysis that we wanted. So I'm gonna take my data in it, which has Amazon uh, Holdings and also Cargill Corporation. I'm gonna create a uh, indicator variable that tells me whether or not this company is publicly listed by whether or not the string contains this pattern. If the string contains a uh, function, just checks the string to see if it satisfies a regular expression. If it does, it gives me a true. So Amazon is true, it is publicly traded. Cargill is a false, it's not publicly traded. Then I wanna get rid of the ticker, right? So I'm gonna go through the name function. I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace the name variable uh, using string replace by finding wherever I can find that, that ticker pattern and getting rid of it. Uh, and that happens here. I end up with Amazon without its stock ticker, but it didn't do anything to Cargill, even though it saw those parentheses, because it did not see that a bunch of capital letters inside of those parentheses, right? Uh, there are there's still double space here. I might, might then want to do another string replace to turn a double space into a single space, but this is fine for now. Any questions on regular? Actually, before I do questions on regular expressions, let's let's take a number out of the middle of a string because that was a question that came up. So let's say our string is uh, you got a name. And that is, uh, what was your first name again? Um, Dohun. I'm just going to type it here so in that way, you know, exactly. Like that, with a number in the middle? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so we have our string. You can see that it's a string. So I'm going to look for, uh, uh, so I'm going to use name.str.replace. And uh, first, let's just do it by hand, right? So I could say, hey, look for a three and get rid of it. Oops. Uh, oh, so this is not a pandas object, is it? Let's do it in pandas, actually. Uh oh, <laughs> this is like I mentioned, uh, Python on the fly is, uh, I'm not as good at as R. What I do wrong here. Uh oh. Oh, Lord. All right, let's not use names. I don't know why that's messing up. Okay, so I think that works. There we go. Okay, so by hand, we've done it, right? We located the three, we got rid of it. Uh, but now we want to use it by regular expression to get rid of any number that might be in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for zero to nine. Uh, and if it finds a zero to nine, it's going to replace it with nothing. Did not like that. Uh, 
So that's just very confusing. As I mentioned, regular expressions are always a cause for headache. And Google it. You can see how complex these regular expressions can get. You can even do stuff like find particular elements of the string and keep that part. Uh, gets a little wild. Oh. Wait a minute. No, I want that. Well, I don't know how why this is not working. Oh, of course. Forgot the brackets. It's always something simple. There we go. OK. Go one step at a time, make sure it's working as you expect. Great. There we go. OK, so I think the problem that I was running into before is that the, the raw string replace function maybe does not automatically take regular expressions. So it worked when I gave it just three, but it didn't work at work when I gave it zero to nine. Uh, so the pandas version, however, of string replace does automatically work with uh, uh, regular expressions. So I could just put that in there. That was what was happening there. So that is how we could take that three out of the middle. Uh, we could also do something like uh, you know space, space. I think it would get rid of that double space that we end up with. Yeah. So now we only have a single space there. So that's how we can do it. Any other questions on uh, regular expressions? Possibly one of the most aggravating parts about regular expressions, by the way, is that they exist in many different languages. Um, and the syntax across languages is very, very similar, but also not exactly the same. So if you go Googling for help with regular expressions, you will often find code that like almost works from a different language. Um, and sometimes the people will not even be particularly clear about what language they're working with. Uh, so you'll end up trying something and being like, why doesn't this work? And then realizing it was written for like Perl or C as opposed to Python. Uh, so that's an aggravating thing. Okay, any questions about going from, uh, about, about working with certain variable types before we move on? All right, so uh, let's talk about using data structure to help with our data wrangling. 
so one of the core steps of data wrangling is how to get information from where it is to where it needs to be. Uh, and this can be very difficult, especially if what we want to do is get things into different rows than they are currently in. Um, you know, we talk about group by and aggregate, but sometimes things can get a little bit more complex. For example, uh, let's say that we want to, oh, why did that disappear? Um, uh, for example, let's say that we want to calculate something, how much something has grown from some initial value, uh, then, you know, aggregate obviously is not going to quite do it for us. Uh, so we can get out, we can, we can sort of cheat our way through a lot of stuff using sort values and using some of the functions that reference different rows in the data, uh, of which there are a couple of rows like that. Uh, we might also use head uh, is, is one way we can do that. So uh, here is an example. So here I have some uh, some data on some tickers for Amazon and Walmart for different days, uh, and I have the stock price for those days. Uh, and then I will uh, take this string date that I've written in and convert it to a date time variable. Right? As I mentioned, you can you know, convert things to date uh, to work with them. So now we'll know the order that those dates come in. So uh, I can use head and tail to refer to the first and last rows of the data. Why might I want to do that? Uh, so a couple reasons. So one, uh, if I'm especially if I'm doing something like calculating growth from the start, then obviously referring to the first row is useful. I can also combine this with group by to refer not to the first or last data row in the data, but the first or last row that that group has. Okay. So in this case, if I want to calculate stock price growth, I can do that. Um, all that I got to do is I take my stock data I just made. I'm going to sort it by ticker and then date. Uh, so that things, uh, the earliest dates are at the top, the latest dates are at the bottom. I'm going to group by ticker, and then I'm going to look at the stock price. I'm going to apply uh, this function right here, this lambda function, which is just taking X and dividing it by the first row, head one, that I see. Uh, the values that I get from that row, uh, which is the stock price, it's the, it's the zeroth column, and then subtract one to make it a percentage growth. Uh, so what do I have here, right? So the first row, there's obviously no growth from the first day to the first day. From the first day to the second day, we have a little bit of growth. From the first day to the third day, we have more growth as well. And then it starts over again for Walmart because we did the group buy, All right? So it's not comparing Walmart to Amazon, it's comparing Walmart to itself. Uh, shift is like head and tail in that it looks at different rows of your data or group, except instead of looking at the first or last, uh, it looks at a certain number of rows above or below based on the number that you give it. Uh, something to be careful about is that shift does not care about the time structure of your data, it only cares about the data structure. So if you, let's say, have you know uh, March 4th and then the next row is March 8th and you tell it to shift up one, it will look to that March 4th. It won't try to look for March 7th and fail, right? It doesn't know the time structure. It just knows the data structure when you're using shift. So here's an example of using shift to calculate daily price growth. So I'm going to create a new column, daily price growth, and take stock price. I'm going to, I'm going to um, uh, sort it by, uh, yeah, I'm sorting values by date. I'm going to group by the uh, ticker again. I'm going to use the stock price. I'm going to shift it by one. So I'm going to look at the stock price above. Uh, so um, here, you know, I'm looking at what's this stock price relative to the day before. And so you can see it's the same growth in both of these columns because in both cases, I'm comparing to the first day. But the second row here, here I'm comparing this day to March 4th. Here I'm comparing this day to just the, the row above, which is a slightly different growth estimate. The first row is missing because obviously it has no row above to shift to. There are thing, trickier things that you can do with shift and first and tail, or shift and head and tail. Uh, so you can get stuff that you might not normally be first or last by filtering on the values that you want before transforming. So for example, uh, let's say that we did uh, this, and then I wanted to say, uh, how, what is the price growth today relative to the first price growth that we see in the data? Well, if I use head, I'm going to get this first row, which isn't what I want anymore. So I might use filter with loc or query to get rid of this first row in each group and then compare to the first row that is still remaining in the data. I might do that. Um, here's an example of a trickier problem that you might come across. Uh, so here is some school data, uh, and I've got different school, got, got different people, they're in different grades, they've taken different exams, they've gotten different scores. Okay. What if I want to, uh, let's say, get the average math score in your grade? So I want the average math score in each grade, and I want that average math score applied to everybody, whether they're taking a math 
test or not. So this person right here, they're in seventh grade. I want there to be a row over a column over here that says, what's the average math score in your grade, grade seven, uh, even though you took an English test, okay? Uh, so there should be an 84 over here because the, uh, there's only one person who took a uh, seventh grade math test. And that's this person, they got an 84. How can I do that? How can I move the data from where it is to where I want it to be? Uh, and this feels like a very niche application, but this is something that actually comes into play a lot. Uh, you know, if you want to compare a particular observation to other people or other observations, this is the sort of thing you got to do. So what am I going to do? First, I'm going to create a new variable called math scores. Uh, and this is uh, based, this is what, whatever your test score is, but only if you are taking a math test. So I'm going to use loc to just, just get the math rows uh, and just use those. I'm going to group by school grade. And I'm going to create, I'm going to use the test score variable. I'm going to get the mean of test score. So what am I doing here? I'm getting the mean of test score uh, by grade only among math tests. Okay, that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to create that new variable. Uh, so now I have a new column that is uh, uh, math scores. That is the average math score in uh, uh, just among math grades. However, when I do this, it will only be present for the math score takers. So I, I think I dropped the, the variable, the column here, but it would basically look like this. It would be 80, because that's the average math score in grade six. 84, that's the average grade, uh, math score in, in grade uh, seven. But then missing, 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 85, missing. Because at this point, I've, get, I've taken the average math score uh, within grade, but I've only applied it to the math rows. I then want to take those math rows and propagate them across the rest of the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable called math average in this grade. I'm going to group by grade again, but this time I'm not using the loc, right? I'm not, I'm not limiting myself to just the math grades. And I'm going to do a maximum here, uh, which says I'm going to look across all the rows in your grade. I'm going to find the math score variable, and I'm going to return the maximum value that I find. Now, max is basically arbitrary here. I can pick any function because there's only going to be one value there. Uh, it's going to be the same for everybody in your grade with the math score. But what I'm doing with this transformation is it's going to look across all the rows in your grade. It's only going to find observations uh, for people who were in math scores. But I'm not applying it just to people in math scores. I'm applying it to everybody. So everybody in that grade is going to get the same thing. So this person's in grade six. They took a math score. They got 80. This person is also in grade six. They also get that same 80 because that the 80 that was sitting next to this person's 80 right here got, maxima, got, got, uh, got um, incorporated through the transformation to sit over here as well. That one was a bit complex. Any questions about that? What I just did there? Um, so we can use the mean instead of max, right? Since there's only one value in that um, column, I guess. Yeah, pretty much any function there would, would serve the same purpose. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, Oh, oh, I did keep it there. Yeah, so now you can see the 80, 84, missing, 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 and so on. Okay, this is the last major section, I promise. Automation. Uh, so data cleaning is a very repetitive process. Uh, you should try not to let it be repetitive, uh, not just because it is boring when it's repetitive, but also because uh, the, the more automation the computer does, the less chance there is that you will screw something up when you do it by hand. Uh, also, if you're gonna go back and change something, Having something in an automated process will often mean that there's less changing that you need to do and less opportunity for you to forget one of the lines of code uh, that you need to change. So two main ways to loop to do to uh, to automate uh, in this context. Uh, one is for loops across columns and for loops more generally. There's also writing of functions. And hopefully if you've been doing Python, you're familiar with these things, but uh, we're going to talk about how they apply to data wrangling in particular. So one thing that you might need to do commonly in uh, Pandas with data wrangling is to apply the same uh, transformation function to many different columns. Uh, cleaning a bunch of different columns all at once can be a big pain, especially if you have a lot of columns. Like, do you really want to apply that same function to every single column? Uh, writing out the names of all those columns would take you a lot of time. Uh, there are, however, some variable selector functions that help you select multiple columns at once. Uh, starts with being a good example. Uh, you can apply a given function to a many different functions at once by just figuring out what, uh, what uh, letters they start with. Uh, if you have a bunch of different columns that all start with the same thing, you can identify them with this. 
or you can use indexing to apply the same function across many columns as well. Here's an example. Uh, so that same stock data that we had before, uh, starting by ticker and date, uh, and I'm gonna apply this function. Oh, this is the same code from before. This is not what I was looking for. Is it the next slide? Oh, got it. Just reestablishing what our data is, right? So we have our data for the stock data. We have our price growth information. We have our, our daily price information. So what do I want to do? So I've got my price growth information uh, in this format right here. Um, and uh, what I want to do is I want to convert it into, let's say, percentages or basis points, perhaps, right? Either way. So uh, I want to convert all of my price growth variables, of which I have two, uh, into those basis points. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to, first of all, give myself a, a, an array of columns that I want to do it for. So I could do this with an index. So if I know that I want to do it to columns four and five, I could just do that. I could write out the names of the columns, could do that. I could also note that both of the columns that I want to do it to start with the words price growth. So I can say, um, uh, take all the stock data columns, give me the ones that start with the words price growth, and then that will give me the columns that I want to loop over. Uh, and for each of those columns, I am going to, oh, sorry. So this will give me the, the vector of columns that I want to loop over. Right? I've, I've gone through each of the stock data columns. I've checked if each of them starts with price growth. If it is, give me it back. So now I have my, my array of columns. Uh, and I'm going to uh, create, uh, take all those columns and just multiply them by 10,000, right? Using the star equals again. And I'm doing this by passing that array of columns I want to adjust into my stock growth data. And there we have it, All right? So now it's multiplied by 10,000. Uh, that was applying one function. You could also apply multiple functions at once. So you can do multiple columns and multiple functions. So we're gonna undo what we just did, divide everything by 10,000 again. Uh, then I'm gonna loop through the same functions using a for loop. The for loop is a bit more flexible. It will allow me to impose multiple, multiple functions in a row. I'm gonna create a new, uh, a new column. So I'm keeping the old ones this time. I'm going to create a percentage version and a basis point version. Uh, I'm going to use those string pasting uh, tips that we had before, just adding together the column name and a underscore percent sort of suffix, uh, where I'm going to multiply that column by 100 to get the percentage amount and by 10,000 to get the basis point amount. And here's what we end up with. Here's the percentage version. Here's the basis point version. All right, that's the basis of for loops. For loops you're already pretty familiar with. Uh, hopefully if you do Python, they pop up all the time. It is very much based around the idea that you're gonna do a lot of for loops. So hopefully you've seen them. Uh, writing functions is also an important part of data wrangling. Uh, a lot of data wrangling, you're gonna end up doing the same thing multiple times. If you're doing something more than once, you're probably better off writing a function and just passing your code to it a couple of different times. Even if it's just twice, it will save you some time, especially if you end up having to go back and change something later. So the structure of, um, uh, a Python function, you define a function, you give the name of that function, the arguments that go into that function are in there. Uh, so in this particular, this, this is going a little bit above and beyond what you have to do, um, but this is gonna give us uh, a, doc, a doc string that tells you what the function does right here. Uh, this is the types of, uh, types of uh, inputs that it wants uh, and the, some defaults as well. And then what the, the output is uh, over here. Uh, inside of that function, you basically, you take those inputs and you do some calculations with them. So argument one is one of our inputs here. We're going to multiply that by 100 to get our sum value. Take our argument two and uh, divide it and get another value. And I'm going to return one of the values here. So whatever you return is what comes back from the function. Uh, some tips for writing functions. Uh, you want to be careful to think about what kinds of inputs and outputs you want your function to have. Uh, something nice here is that you know you're not writing functions for like production work here. Uh, you know, if you're writing a function like to go in a package, you got to be really careful because somebody else is going to use your function, and it needs to be fully documented. It needs to be very consistent. It needs to be locked down so that you can't use it wrong in many ways, and though it gives error messages. But in data wrangling, often you're just writing for yourself, and so you want to have like you know comments in there so that you know what your function is doing. But also, it doesn't necessarily need to be a flexible function. You can just say, okay, it only works in this one way, uh, but I'm only going to use it in that one way. And that's fine, right? Um, so uh, do think about what types of inputs and outputs you want. Um, make it work for what you're going to do. Often you're just taking code that you've already written and pasting it into a function so you can use it more flexibly, maybe making some of the arguments, things that you can change. 
Uh, I'm not going to go super deep into, into doing functions because there are many other places to cover it, uh, and it's a super deep topic. But just a reminder to do it, and that it's often worth it in 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 doing data wrangling, right? If you go all the way back to you know we were reading in all those uh, Excel files. Maybe you want to have a function that, that takes the Excel file you just read in and processes it, or reads it in and processes it in for you. Uh, and then you can, instead of having to put that inside of a for loop or something like that, you can just pass it off to a function, which gives you back a processed and finished code, or a processed and finished data frame. All right, that's all that I have for automation. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Finishing up. Uh, so some final notes, obviously we can't, oh, that, there we go. Uh, we can't possibly cover everything. Uh, so just a couple of last final notes. Uh, one about saving your data. Uh, once you've done all your data wrangling, how are you going to save it? First of all, I do want to point out generally when you're working with a project, you want to keep hold of your raw data and the processing data. Don't throw it away. Uh, for one thing, you might want to redo something later. Uh, for another thing, somebody else might want to come in and see what you did and whether you did it properly. Uh, and for another, it's just a good process. Um, but once you're done, how do you save the process data so you don't have to go back and process again? There are many different formats to save data in. Uh, I mean, the most common one would probably be CSVs. You can use the two CSV pandas function to make a CSV out of your data frame. Good to go. Uh, CSV is not a particularly compact format. Uh, so if you, if you have a small data set, Great, use CSV. If you have something giant, you probably want to use something that uses more compression. Uh, one option is Parquet. You can use two Parquet to save it as a Parquet file, but that is not as flexible. If you send somebody a Parquet file, they will often not know what to do with it. So you will probably, that's, that's where you have a big data set that you're going to be working on on your own. But there are many more formats than that as well. Look into them with the two functions. Uh, also, please, please document your data. You will forget what your variable names mean if you, even if you name them very well. Uh, so at the very least, keep a spreadsheet that describes what the meaning of each of the variables is in your data set, and ideally also what the values of that variable actually mean. Excuse me. Um, so for example, if you have a variable in there called gender, uh, and it takes the values of one and zero, which, which number is which gender? Uh, have you allowed for other kinds of genders? Uh, you know, there's lots of different details in the data set that you want to know about when you're opening that data set up later, even a couple of weeks later, and you forget what you did. So in that case, you can solve that pretty easily by just not calling it gender, by calling it, say, female or male or something like that. Um, but you would still want to have it in a spreadsheet somewhere. And that could be a spreadsheet or a data frame that you save as well. Um, uh, but that is always something that you want to do for sure. All right, that is all the tips and tricks that I have. Uh, the next step is to do a walkthrough of some data cleaning. Um, I guess any questions before we move on to that process? All right. Okay. So let's do some, uh, some walkthrough stuff. Um, so I will warn you ahead of time. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I am not as fluent in pandas as I am in R. So this will be a bit more stop and go, uh, but it will be probably a little bit closer to the experience that you might have as a starting pandas user trying to work through this example. Uh, so I gave out the link to the uh, GitHub earlier. Uh, let's go back to that. Uh, so you can go to the link that's in the chat. If you go to uh, this green link here, download uh, download a zip file, it will download these files for you. So what is going on in all of this? Uh, so um, first of all, we have a readme here. Oh. Uh, this, this GitHub will also have links to the slides and the video once it's ready as well, by the way. Okay, so uh, we have a bunch of different data sets here. We have some census data. We have EADA data, which is basically like a sports, uh, college sports organization. Um, we have IPEDS data, which has information on colleges and the, some New York Times data on coronavirus cases uh, as of July. And what we wanna do with this um, is, oop, let's open up the readme here. Okay, so here is our goal. Let's open up a new 
uh, Jupiter. Okay, so here's what we want to do. Uh, we want to create a data set that has one observation per college. Uh, it says per day, but I think that's actually not accurate. Um, so we have a bunch of different files that we want to clean and combine together. That's going to be our task here. Uh, so we have an IPEDS 2018 file. This has information on the percentage of people in distance education, tuition share. We've got a calculation for how to calculate uh, the tuition share of income. So like of a college's revenues, how much of it is coming from tuition. Uh, we have an IPEDS 2019 file, which tells us whether the college is private or public. Uh, we have the EADA file, which tells us whether the college is division one in sports. We have a, uh, some documentation here telling us that the classification code one through three is division one. Uh, we have the New York Times data, uh, which has county by county information on COVID cases on July 31st, or we, and we want to get July 31st. Uh, we have the census data, uh, which has by county population. We have uh, oh, I guess this is from an R package, uh, so we might skip that one for now, but there is actually a uh, Python function for lo loading data from R packages. And we have uh, some R data uh, that has uh, pre-prepared prepared data of foot traffic visits. And the idea here is to link together all this information and try to figure out uh, uh, whether or not uh, the, co the um, county case rates have any relationship to how much reopening a college did in fall 2020. This is from a project that I worked on. So the task here, though, Combine everything together. How are we going to combine all of these things together? Uh, so the first step is, as always, to look at our data. Uh, so let's open up our iPads 2018 file here and just look at it. Uh, so we have CDS file 662. Now this is going to open up in Stata. This is a Stata file format, which is Stata is another data processing thing like R or Pandas, um, very common in economics. Uh, and a lot of uh, in government data sources will provide you data files. So we have our data here. We can take a look at it as we always want to look at our data. So what do we have? Uh, we have a unit ID, which looks like a ID variable. Maybe we can use this later to uh, merge some data. We also have the name of a college. Maybe that will come in handy. Uh, and we wanted to get the uh, distance education and tuition share from this. So uh, we need to find out what those variable names are. So what's, uh, what's distance education? Uh, so if I look in the variable names here, so these, these variables are what are called labeled. So it's sort of like having a spreadsheet of variable descriptions, but in the data set itself. I don't think Pandas does this um, or has an ability to do this. Maybe it does, I'm not sure. Um, but you can certainly at least have a thing like this in its own data frame that is not necessarily completely tied to the data. But we have three different uh, variables here. Percentage of students enroll exclusively in distance education, in some distance education, not at all. We're going to go with this one, PCT, D-E-E-X-C. Uh, so we're going to keep that one. And then we also have this calculation for tuition share that we can use. OK, so let's get started with that. So we're going to uh, import pandas as PD to start out with. Let's read in our iPads 2018. Uh, so iPads 2018. And we're going to do uh, pd.read. There's no autocomplete in this one. I can, uh, great. I think it's read stata. Uh, and that's going to be in our iPads folder. Now, by the way, I'm not doing C colon slash, right? Because I'm uh, I, this this has been saved in this uh, data wrangling workshop folder, of which iPads is a subfolder. And I can just go to our data set right there. And hopefully that will read in properly. And we can just read take a look at it in pandas as well. Yep, worked properly. There we go. Um, so now we can see all the data. And we just want to select some of the variables. So we want our distance education variable, which was again, PCT DEEXC. Uh, so that's going to be keeping. That's going to be one of them. And we also want to do this tuition share calculation. So we can take this Uh, 
let's just create it good old fashioned style. Tuition share. Now there are of course ways to do this that do not require us to write out iPads 2018 over and over again, uh, but we're just gonna go ahead and do it the simple way. Simple yet laborious, but not that long. Okay, so we are gonna create that uh, and we're only gonna keep tuition share. We also want to keep some uh, uh, identifying key variables so that we can use those to merge with the other data sets later. Uh, so um, let's let's certainly do unit ID because that seems likely to help, especially with the other iPads data set, merging those together. We might come back and get um, uh, the institution name later if that comes in handy as well. Don't know. Uh, but let's stick with that for now. Uh, let's say iPads 2018 is going to be uh, just those ones right there. Let's make sure that this all worked. You always want to do. There we go. So we loaded it just to unit ID, percent, uh, and tuition share. Okay. So that's iPads 2018. Let's take a look at iPads 2019 as well. Which is 417. Okay, and from this, we want to get whether the college is private. So let's see if we have some sort of private variable, nothing like that. Uh, how about institutional control? No, how about if we just look through the variable names? That's another way. How about sector? Is sector uh, the variable that we want? So let's take a look. Yes, that looks like it is the one that we want. Okay, so we have uh, a variable sector in here that seems to be the one that we want. And we need to know what values correspond to things. So let's read it into pandas and see what we can do. So that's our 2018 done. And we also wanna get 2019. Okay, so let's read that in. And let's just see, I guess we can also work with this separately so we don't have to rerun that a whole bunch of times. Okay, looks good. And then we were gonna look at the, um, what was it? Control, no, sector. Okay, great, so it looks like we have, okay, so we have a categorical variable, it read it in as categorical. Um, so that's, uh, that's good. So we can uh, use our filtering to keep uh, just the ones that we want. So it looks like there's a couple different things, ways that it can be private here. Uh, so we're going to do FS 2019 private. And that's going to be uh, if it is, if the uh, iPads 2019 sector is in, if you remember that one. Uh, any of these, and this should just work. So we just want to copy in the exact category names that we have. Uh, so we have private, not-for-profit, four-year or above. That's one of them. We have private, not-for-profit, two years. And we have private, not-for-profit, less than two years. And let's check our work as we always do. Didn't like that. Why didn't it like that? Oh, right. Okay, so it's, yeah, I'm trying to take a whole sector and doing in, but in is a single thing. So um, it's a lambda, it's a lambda function. That's what it is. Okay, so let's go back to might work. My Lambda syntax is very rusty. 
Ah, it didn't work. Okay. Uh, how do you do a lambda? Let's go back to the slides. Check it out. Uh, there we go. Ah, okay, yeah, it's not parentheses, it's that. Okay, so we're gonna do right, is that right? Lambda x. Yeah, I think that'll work. Hey, it worked. Okay, so then we uh, have created our private variable. Now we can think what uh, columns we want to keep. We want to keep obviously our private variable. We're also going to need unit ID to link up with the iPads 2018. So we're going to just have those. Great, there we go. So now we have our private, we have our unit ID and we can uh, start merging things together as well. So let's do a merge. So we want to merge iPads 2019 and 2018. Uh, these should be on the uh, unit ID level where we have one row per unit ID. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna be using to merge. So uh, first let's check and make sure that that is true, that that is accurate, that we actually have one row per unit ID. Uh, so we're gonna do, um, let's do iPads 2018 uh, duplicated. Uh, unit ID and then dot max false. Okay, so there's no duplicates of unit ID in 2018. Let's check 2019 as well. Also false, good to go. So now we can merge those with confidence. So we're going to take uh, uh, our new full data, is going to go or merge things in, in together. We got iPads 2018 dot merge, iPads 2019. We're going to do it on unit ID. Uh, and then we'll take a look and see that that worked properly. There we go. Everything seemed to line up. Um, if we saw a bunch of things that uh, were missing for one of these, but not for the other, and that would suggest that there were things that were not lining up. Um, and uh, oh, we we also could how how do we what do we want to keep? Let's keep uh, everything. I believe outer should keep everything, whether or not it finds a match. Yeah. Okay. You can, by the way, do different merges with different hows to check how many things are not matching. So outer should give me everything. So I get three, seven, three, uh, six rows, right? What happens if I do a left merge? Do I get the same number of rows? Because if I do, that tells me that everything in the, uh, in the right found a match on the left. Three, seven, three, six. Great. So everything in the right found a match on the left. Because if it didn't, then it would have dropped those right columns and I would have ended up with fewer rows. What if I do a right merge? Ah, same number. I could also skip doing left and right and just done inner, uh, which only keeps things that keep finding matches, which again is everything. So everything found a match here. So it really doesn't matter wh which how I do, but I did the merge there. Okay. So that's iPads 2018 and iPads 2019. Uh, let's add a new one here and let's do the next one, which will be EADA. So let's read in. This is an Excel sheet. So we're going to need to read Excel. EADA is read oh, PD dot read Excel. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Ooh, didn't like it. It is read Excel, isn't it? Uh... Oh, that's right. Read Excel stopped working. Forgot about that. Yeah, it just doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. Um, okay, Excel is not fine. Not supported. That's fine. What are we going to do when we have this problem? Let's take a look at our EADA. Let's go to our data. And let's just convert it to a format that does work. I'm just going to do save as. 
CSV. And there we go, right, problem solved. Okay, so from this, we want to get uh, uh, whether it is a division one college, which is if classification code is one through three. Uh, so we can do that. EADA division one is EADA. Now, a couple of ways I could do this, I could do a lambda to check if each row is one through three. Um, I could also note that it's a number and let's see what values that number takes. Because uh, if it's if it doesn't take anything below one, I can just check if it's below the number four, right? So um, let's do uh, what was the command to check all the different values? I believe it was. PD.unique. Go. So let's take a look at that. We're always exploring our data. So uh, pd.unique of the ADA classification code. Classification code. Two. Oh, and let's. Okay, we got one, two. I don't see anything below one. So if I were to just say, hey, is it below four? That should give me all of the division one uh, things. So it'll be EADA division one. It's going to be EADA classification code is less than four. And then we should just be able to keep. Oh, we didn't check uh, what our merging variables were likely to be. So that seemed to work without error. We have still we have a unit ID, probably from the uh, iPads data and institution name. So uh, we're going to stick with unit ID and our division one. There we go. Okay, now we have our EADA. We can add that to our merging here. Uh, so fold. I, I could just do dot merge again, but for simplicity, just to make it a little bit easier, we'll see we're going to uh, do a second line of code. Full data dot merge EADA, uh, and we're going to do it on unit ID again. Now this time, uh, you know, I think if I if there's not a match, I want to keep it if it's in iPads. But if it's not in EADA for some reason, I'm just going to let it drop. So I'm going to make that a how equals left. All right, so it's going to keep it if it's in full data and not in EADA. But if it's in EADA and not full data, drop it out. So let's do that. Um, and then uh, just in case there's something that doesn't merge, I, I just want to I'm going to assume that anything that's not in the EADA data set is not division one. Uh, so um, let's first of all make sure that this works. Great. And we do have some missings here. So we have some things that did not find a match. So we're going to need to fill those in. Uh, so we can use a Boolean mask to fill some things in. So full data. Uh, and we're going to use um, the iloc process here. You notice, by the way, like I said, I'm not particularly skilled or experienced working with pandas. But because I know the concepts of how data wrangling works, I always know what I'm looking for. So even if I don't have the loc syntax in the top of my head, I know exactly how to look it up uh, because we know what the process is and what we're trying to do. Looking up code is the easy part. Um, so let's go back to our Boolean mask, which was uh, even here. Under our logical conditions. <laughs> Here we go, creating a categorical variable. Yeah, so we just put the condition inside the loc. Great. Okay. And we tell it what variable to mess with. So uh, we want to do iloc. Oh, no, not iloc. That's for indexes. Loc, uh, which is if uh, is, is non, I believe, is the function is dot none. Let's check this out. Is dot n-a-n n-a-n. pd dot n-a-n. 
Don't know. Time for Google. Uh, pandas, check if an ant. Oh, right. NP.NAN is null. Okay. Or, oh, no, it is. That is none. Okay. There's our pen. There we go. Uh, not this one. This one is none. PD.none. Hmm. You lied to me, Google. Oh, because it's in NumPy, not in Pants. That's it. There we go. We got there. Okay. NumPy dot is not. Oh, geez. Okay. NP dot is not. Can I just pass as a column? Probably not. But let's give it a shot, see what happens. Uh, division one. I don't think this is going to work. It did not work. Okay. Okay, so we probably need to do a. There we go. Okay, so what I did, I used the lambda to go through each uh, row of the division one variable, uh, checked if it was missing, uh, and then filled it in with a false if it was indeed missing. I did that without knowing any of this syntax because we just know what to look up for, right? Uh, data wrangling is a lot of this sort of mungling here. Okay, so what's next? We got our EADA. Next up is the New York Times. So this is also a CSV file. So we can use read CSV. And let's take a look. OK, so oh. there we go. OK, so what do we have here? Uh, we have uh, cases, which is what we want. We have a date. Uh, we wanted to get on July 31st, right? July 31st. So let's start by limiting our data to that before we think about anything else. Um, so. What class is that date variable? Do I, am, I, am I trying to match a date? Am I trying to match a string? There we go. Okay, date is an object. Thank you for helpful. <laughs> um, uh, Oh, come on. Okay, well, let's see if I can uh, limit the data here. So NYT, I want to get um, it's in year, month, day format. So I want to limit it just to the date is equal to 2020-07-31. Let's just see if that works. Oh, right. Uh, NYT. That seemed to work. Okay, so maybe it was a string. It was not a date when it read it in. 
Okay, so we can limit the data to that. Uh, and now we have the task of uh, merging it in. So what do we have? Uh, we have to think about how we can merge it into the data that we have. So far, the data that we have only has unit ID as a, as a, a key variable. We don't have that here, clearly. Uh, we have the data that appears to be defined on the basis of county and state. And we have FIPS code, which I can tell you is a mix of county and state uh, numerically. So these two are, mean Wyoming, right? And then these three are the Sweetwater, uh, sorry, 037 is Sweetwater County within Wyoming. It's also dot zero, uh, which is unnecessary. This should be an integer. Um, so, uh, but maybe we, maybe, maybe we don't even need this code, so we don't need to worry about it. We also have cases and deaths, whatever we're interested in. So uh, we need to have some sort of county and state information to be able to merge with. Uh, so let's go back to our iPads and see what we have. Um, so let's uh, maybe look at iPads 2019 and just look at it by itself and see what variables are in there. Okay, so, okay, we have a uh, state. Remember it's FIPS. Um, and we have, let's see here, zip code, because we also want county, presumably. Do we have county? Let me scroll over any further. Maybe let's check in here. Ah, FIPS county code, county CD. So let's take a look at that and see what that looks like. Okay. It's a categorical variable. Uh, looks like it's got name of the county, the word county, comma, two digit state abbreviation. Um, you know, I'm wondering. Ah, see, now this is interesting, right? This is what I mentioned before about having to be careful about variable types when you're reading stuff in. So what we have here is that in the Stata data set, this is a categorical variable, which means it's storing that number, but those numbers are labeled. But the numbers are what we actually want, not the labels here, because look at the numbers there that are underlying this. These are those FIPS codes. Those are numbers that would be very easy to merge with the FIPS code numbers that are in the New York Times data. Uh, but when we were reading it in, it's taking this label on top of it as opposed to the number underneath it that would be easy to work with, right? Numbers are pretty much always easier to work with than letters when it comes to this stuff. So we're going to have to go into the read Stata documentation to figure out how to get it to read in uh, this county code as the underlying number as opposed to the string that it is giving us or the, the categorical variable that it's giving us. So. Uh, Pandas read Stata. Look at the documentation. What? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, convert categoricals to categorical vector variables converts to true. So yeah, let's just turn that to false and then see what we can get out of that. There we go. Now we have some numbers that are going to be easy to merge. Okay, so we're going to go back up here. Uh, we're going to do convert. Oh, except uh, this sector variable was also categorical. So it's, it's going to mess this up when we do this. So what can we do? You know what? We could go back and rewrite this code right here to base this on the numbers. But let's just sort of have our lunch and eat it too. Um, we're going to create a second run of iPads 2019, which is just iPads linker. And all this is going to do is this is going to link together the unit ID and the uh, FIPS codes. Um, so uh, we're going to do PD, the same thing as up here, but with convert categoricals equals 
false. Okay, and we're gonna do iPads linker. All we need out of this is unit ID and county code. Great. So now we still have that original with iPads 2019, but now we have iPads linker, which is going to help us link unit ID to county code. Uh, and uh, we want to match this with the New York Times data, which has which has named it FIPS. So instead of county code, we're going to call it FIPS. So we're going to do uh, dot rename. Uh, no idea how the syntax for this works. I think it's uh, FIPS county code. X is equals one, perhaps? Uh, no. Other way around? Hey, there we go. Okay, so uh, we have how we want. Now we can use this to link. We can we can link our full data that we already have with the iPads linker, which will give us a FIPS column. We can then use that FIPS column to link to the New York Times, which has the FIPS data. Uh, one last step we need to do for this is that this is uh, clearly not an integer but this is an integer. So we're gonna to need to turn that into an integer. So uh, NYT FIPS is int. This might work. You might not like that. Didn't like it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, oh wait, we had that convert function from before. Let's go ahead and just use that. It was as type, as type is what it was. So NYT as type, uh, and we have FIPS character. Oh, no, integer. No. Google, uh, pandas. As type integer. Well, it's going on with pydata.org. Perhaps they have been hacked, or maybe my computer is just being weird. Okay. Do, 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 do. Oh, got it. No type. Okay. NYT FIPS equals NYT FIPS dot as type int. Get that a go. Oh, come on. Cannot convert non finite values to integers. So that's missing data in there. Okay. So um, we're going to use. We're gonna get rid of all that because we can't do anything with the missing data. We're not gonna be able to merge it anyway. So there's no point keeping it around. So we're also going to, we're gonna keep just this date uh, and we're gonna do a multiple condition and um, not is non, oh, uh, np.install, um, nyt Let's copy the syntax that we had before. Oh yeah, we used an apply, okay. Sure, parentheses balance. Okay, give that a shot. Still didn't like it. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll do this in two steps. That already worked fine. We're going to go back down here for our is non. We got rid of the missings. Oh, we didn't get rid of the missings, did we? That's fine. 
Uh, we're still going to use this syntax here. Okay, NYT equals NYT dot loc NYT FIPS not is none. Give that a shot. Oh, come on. Doesn't. All right, there is the drop in, isn't there? Okay, let's just give that a shot. This is pretty representative of how many data cleaning sessions look. Uh, it's just for the other ones, I was a little bit more prepared because I use the language more often, but this, this idea still applies. Okay, so we're gonna start by limiting ourselves just to the columns that we want. So NYT is NYT. We got FIPS, we got, uh, was it cases? Yeah, it's probably all we need. And then we are going to make sure that that worked. What? Oh. Okay, so far so good. Next, uh, we are going to drop an A. seemed to work. Okay, so now let's see once we've dropped those missings, if we can convert our types. Yay. Okay, we have our types, we have our NYT. This should be good to go. So now we have FIPS in one data set, we have FIPS in the other data set, we have the linker to put the two together. Something to note is that the, the FIPS is a five digit thing, but the leading zero has been dropped here, but it was also dropped uh, for the linker. So that's fine. Yeah, also dropped for the linker, so that's fine. So going back down to our full data, we can do some more merges. Full data equals full data dot merge iPads linker. We're gonna do that on unit ID and uh, how equals outer. It should be everything anyway, that's fine. So just check that. Great, so now we have FIPS in there. So now we can merge in the New York Times, full data, full data dot merge. Uh, New York Times on FIPS. And again, let's do just like with the EADA, let's do a left merge. Probably should have checked first that FIPS was unique for the New York Times, but it's probably okay. Looks like we had one FIPS code that did not merge in properly. Okay, so we made it this far. Those of you who are still hanging on. <laughs> What's next? Next, we have the census. And let's see what that gives us here. Whoa, what's your problem? Oh, Lord. Okay, time to read the data itself. Ah, so we have a sort of a uh, row getting in our way here. It's trying to read this as the first row, but we don't want that. So let's see if we can find a way to skip that first row. Pandas read CSV, probably close on these tabs here. No, oh, come on.
Okay, we want to skip a row. Skip a row. Give me the documentation. Ah, without header. Mm -hmm. It is read from the line specified by header and the above lines are ignored. So we just say header equals two and that should give us the ability to skip that one column. Still no. Hmm. I had a problem reading this CSV file before in different languages, but Pandas doesn't like it. So it seems to be having a problem with the, the uh, codec here, how to read the characters. Now a continuation byte. Okay. Hmm. Why does it not like that? Position three. All right. Well, let's see if we can do some processing to get this into something that pandas can actually read. Um, so doing something, some clean, a little bit of cleaning by hand in Excel or whatever is not the end of the world. Uh, it's not you know, forbidden. So let's just take this data that we have and clean it up a little bit. Oops, not that. Okay, so uh, we've tried reading it in here. Let's just see if this works. If we just save it as our own thing, maybe it will like that. Save it as a CSV. County simple, we called it. We don't need this anymore. Huh, huh, like that. Don't know why, but it did. Okay, so uh, we want to get count by county population in 2019. So we got two things to think about. One, how are we going to merge with everything else? And two, how can we get this 2019 data? There's 2019 right there. I see some commas. Are those going to be is that is that counting as a number uh, or is that uh, not counting as a number? So uh, census dot d type. Types. There we go. Object. What was it? Checking your variable types. Dot D types. It should be giving me my types. Is it not giving me my types? All right, well, if it's not cooperating, we will force it to cooperate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take uh, census. I'm gonna look at my 2019 column, make sure that that's the proper way to refer to it. Yes, it is. And I'm just gonna take the first uh, element there. No. I'm going to add one to them. If it will let me add one to it, then it is a number. If it won't, then it is a string. It did not. It is a string. Okay. So we need to uh, use some string replace stuff to uh, get rid of those commas. So census teen string replace comma nothing. 
Let's see if that worked. It did. Great. Uh, and then we can also convert that to as type uh, int. There we go. Okay. So uh, you know, we only need county to be able to link things and the, uh, the number over here. Uh, so we can get those. So census is census county 2019. And then we're going to go ahead and rename um, 2019 to uh, population. It's the other way around, isn't it? Oh, right. Axis equals one. I was right the first time. Hey, we got it. Okay. So now we need to link it. We got county over here to link with. Now, the, there are a couple problems here. One, uh, the thing that we had for county elsewhere is the FIPS code. And here we only have the name. Second, the name starts with a period. That does not make any sense at all. Uh, third, the, name, the county and the state name are combined together. So let's see what we can do about this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that period. That seems like bad. Uh, so uh, let's see if we can use string, what was it, string sub, dot sub, I believe. That would be a typical way that you'd string. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so census. County, census, county. I might need to do another lambda um, to to the end. Will that work? It didn't work, and in a weird way. All right. Well, let's just do apply. Oh, right. Index starts from zero. There we go. OK, we've got rid of our period. That's good. Next, we need to either split this apart into something that we can link with, with the other data or put the other data together in such a way that we can you know, combine it. So if I remember correctly, uh, our New York Times data had county names in it. So let's go back to that and just see what that looked like. Yeah, we got county, we got state, so that should be good. We should be able to put these two together uh, into something that will match uh, what we have there. So uh, it was here we just have the county name, but here it's county and then the word county and then a comma and then Alabama. So we're going to go back to the New York Times here uh, and we are going to keep, we're going to create a new variable, um, NYT, and it was called County with a capital C, what are the names down here? County with a small c. So we got uh, county equals NYT county. Let's make sure that this works. Yeah, great. Okay. County plus the word county, and then a comma and a space, and then NYT state. Great. That looks good. Uh, so we should be able to use this to link up the data that we have. Um, what's this problem up here? Oh, it didn't like that. Oh, because I used a comma instead of a plus. That looks good. There we go. OK, so we can now use this to, should be able to use this to link up with the census. Um, so full data merge in my T, I gotta read that. So now we can do full data, full data dot merge with the census on county with a capital C. Uh, and we're gonna start with um, left and just see how that goes. Great, so that seemed to work. We brought in the population, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, let's see if there were anything that didn't work. So let's try a right merge. So we have 3736 rows now. Um, let's try right. Ah, 5323. So there's a bunch of counties in the data that are not getting matched up with uh, uh, 
because there's a bunch of counties in the census data that are not getting matched up with the, the counties in the New York Times data. Now, it's possible that some counties just didn't have data on cases, and so they're not in there for that reason. That's why they're not matching up, or that there aren't any colleges in those counties, uh, in which case it wouldn't be an iPad, so we wouldn't have anything to match with. Um, but when we have a, a mismatch like this, it's always a good idea to, you know, look into it, see what's going on. Uh, so let's take, uh, we're going to go right, and we're going to just, just get the ones that are not matching. So we're going to use a loc to just pick out the non-matching ones. So that can be anything that doesn't have a unit ID. So uh, let's dot loc. Uh, Full data equals full data. Oh. Loc and then full data unit ID. Dot apply lambda x is non x. So that should pick out ones that are ju just the ones that are missing unit ID. And then we can take a look at what their county is. And maybe their population as well. See if that shows any hints. Is this the problem? Let's see that. Oh, NP. There we go. Okay. So these are the ones that did not find any matches. Okay. Um, let's look through them. Uh, so let's say. One, two, 20. Lots of stuff in Alabama, Barber County, Alabama. So, Autauga County, Alabama in that's the census. See, that should link up. Why is that not linking up? Let's look at the whole thing. Oh, Autauga did. Then why did it give me? Because if I talk it didn't, it wouldn't be it would it would be on this list. No. Well, whatever. Okay, Barber didn't, uh, but Barber is in there, so that is concerning. Well, this is the point at which we would have to start digging into the specific reasons why there aren't matches. I can also tell you from having done this workshop before that one of the reasons we don't have matches is because uh, some counties are not called county. Uh, so for example, in Louisiana, there's a lot of parishes uh, in, a, in Alaska, it's something else. And so we get a lot of mismatches in Alaska and Louisiana. Uh, when I did this in R, these counties were not problems. So I'm not exactly sure why it's not lining up now. It could be some slight difference in the way that the, the strings are encoded in a way that Python cares about and R does not. Um, but this would be the point at which you have to delve a lot deeper. Uh, there's only 10 minutes left uh, and we've gotten pretty far into it. Um, and you can sort of see where we run into roadblocks that could take a long time to figure out. This is sort of the process. Are there any questions about what I've been doing with all this? All right, uh, that is it then. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I will be posting on that GitHub. If you want to go back there, you can download the files. I'll also put up the slides and the video once it's ready. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. All righty, thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.